Everyone, remain calm. Yeah, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. But then later there's running and screaming. Somebody talk to me, what is happening? Welcome to Jurassic World. You're listening to the Jurassic Park Podcast. You want to consult here or in my bungalow? <laughs> Hold on to your butt. Well, we're back. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 180th episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Jost, and we're here to discuss all things Jurassic Park. In this episode, we're going to present our Jurassic Year in Review for 2018. It's been a crazy year. I mean, look at it. Everything that we've got over the course of this past year. Movies, games, uh, we got toys, we got merchandise, everything out there that you could possibly want as a Jurassic fan, we got it. So today we're going to look back on each and everything that we could possibly remember. So we're going to look back on stuff like that with contributor of the podcast here, Tom Fishenden. Tom, probably more than I'd say almost anybody else in the Jurassic Park fan community, really has his hands in each and every aspect of the fandom. Like I said, whether it is the games, the toys, uh, the films, the merchandise, he has his hands in everything. He wants to help promote it, discuss it, contribute, play along, do whatever it takes to be involved in all aspects of the fandom so i think tom is the perfect choice to have here in the 2018 year in review of course we do have news to discuss we have youtube stuff to promote on our channel we have stuff on our website great articles but we're gonna skip over all of that stuff because me and tom talked for i think it was two and a half hours so if you looked at the timestamp on this episode yeah you got a lot ahead of you so why don't we get this one kicked off with our 2018 Jurassic Year in Review. Where's Aunt Claire? 7 o'clock tomorrow night on the East Dock. Make sure he gets it right. But it's alive! And everyone on the planet is going to line up to appreciate it and everything done. People would say they could see the fleas. Oh, I could see the fleas. Mommy, can't you see the fleas? Are, are these characters uh, auto erotic? I don't know. Come on! As a Jurassic Park fan, 2018 was probably the biggest year we could ever ask for as fans. And we got uh, films, we got, um, what do we get, games, we got merchandise, toys, we got all kinds of stuff leading up to the promotion of this film and even after the film, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And today we're going to talk all about that stuff here on the podcast. So I brought in my good friend, Tom Fishenden. How you doing, Tom? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Are you all right? Oh, yeah, I'm doing good. Back from my vacation, and uh, I'm just, I'm still warming up. So we'll see if uh, this <laughs> <Yeah>. goes right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all good. I'm, you know, feeling good about this. I think we've got a lot of interesting things to touch on. I'm not going to lie. There's a couple of things on our little talking list that I've looked at, and I don't even remember what they were. So it's going to be interesting when we get there. Um, yeah. But yeah. I oh, think we've I was, had a lot of stuff. I was trying to make, like, compile a list of a lot of the big talking points and big things that happened throughout the year. And, um, I'm, I guarantee I left off a lot, but I was surprised with the amount of things that actually ended up on this list. And, um, <laughs> you know, throughout the course of the year, uh, I don't know how many episodes we've had, there's, but there's been a lot, but, um, especially with all the bonus episodes and everything, we've talked about a lot of this stuff, um, pretty consistently, especially like the toys and, and, and merchandise and promotions and stuff like that. And of course the film. Um, but you know, as a, a, a recap episode, I felt like we had to just touch on everything just to kind of talk about how big of a year it really was. Um, and especially not to confuse it with the past like three years that we've had leading up to Fallen Kingdom. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been crazy, man. Um, why don't we go ahead and, um, just start with the film itself, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Yeah. I mean, you can't get any better or bigger than that, right? <laughs> no, I definitely think, you know, it's a release year. So the highlight of the year has got to be in the film. And um, 
what a film it was. I think it is safe to say, and I'm sure you'd agree, that this is arguably as decisive as, if not more decisive, than Jurassic Park 3 in terms of the kind of impact this has had on the community. It's certainly been interesting kind of seeing a lot of different opinions after the film released. Yeah, that's a very good point. I don't know if I've had, uh, heard anybody put it that way yet, actually. Um, but yeah, I think you're pretty accurate there. Jurassic Park 3 definitely you know, tears fans down the middle as to whether it's good or not and uh, what parts they like about it or not. And this one, um, unfortunately, is is very similar in that matter. To me, I feel like it's it's fantastic. I love it. I've talked about that a ton. I'm actually watching it right now as we speak. I got it on in the background. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know, at first, I, I, I've talked about this plenty that I just was a little disappointed, but mostly because of, I guess, all the promotion probably from, um, I forget if uh, at this point if it came out before the Super Bowl I think it did, right? The trailer. I think I think there was a trailer before Super Bowl and then we had yeah. the Super Bowl trailer as well. I think we had a TV spot at Super Bowl. So, yeah, that, probably um, I liked it a lot. Yeah, probably from like that point out or so, we just started to get a lot of trailers and whatnot. And it certainly um hyped us up a lot and it got us very yeah. excited, but at the same time we were like, well, there's a lot that we see here in this trailer. And knowing a lot of the production, um, I know a lot of people that listen to this podcast will have known a lot about the production and and the behind the scenes and what went into it. But maybe a lot of people didn't, so the trailers weren't as bad for them. But when you know a lot about what's going on in the movie, you saw the trailer, you pieced everything together, and um, it definitely like put the entire movie together for you in your eyes. And that was a little disappointing to me because when I left the theater, I was like, oh, man. I already saw that movie. That's a shame. I liked what yeah. I saw, but I already saw that movie. I think you highlight some interesting points because the trailers really kind of, they showed all of the wow moments. So all mm-hmm. you kind of actually got when you went and saw the film was all the collective tissue between those wow moments. And so, yeah, you get some character development, you get some storyline, everything like that. But ultimately, the main reason that people go and see a film at the cinema is to be immersed in these like massive sequences that you would never see anywhere else. So to kind of have those taken out of the film and already shown in all of the marketing materials, like you say, means that the film didn't really have as much of an impact. Um, and I definitely feel for me, I mean, you can probably hear it in that first recording I did with Sonny way back when I saw the film. The fact that I'd already seen all the big set pieces really kind of meant that the film wasn't as impactful as it was intended to be because it had lost a lot of those big punches already. Yeah, I totally agree. And there there was some surprises here and there. Um, even the, the big like T-Rex roaring against the volcano, like that, I figured when I watched that in the trailer, I was like, you know, maybe they're going to change this and it won't actually happen like this. And while that yeah. that moment did happen like that, there was a bit surrounding it that was like, oh, that was a little new. I, I didn't expect that to happen. Like the Carnotaurus yeah. versus the Sinoceratops bit. Like that that was surprising that was to a me. Really but nice addition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was nice. There was a few moments like that, but um overall it was it was fairly predictable. But I still love the movie and after, you know, f- future viewings and stuff like that, I've I've really, really grown to to love this movie. And it's up there maybe um top three i would say for me i yeah i think for me my choice is probably fourth on my list so mine would go jurassic park jurassic world the lost world and then fallen kingdom i do i really really like fallen kingdom and i like it a lot more after my rewatches and i think that the helicopter sequence at the beginning especially is like hands down the best sequence in any Jurassic Park film for an opening. It dwarfs everything, even the original, in my opinion. Um, Oh, yeah. I just, I don't know. I think maybe with The Lost World and Jurassic Park, it's the nostalgia factor that those are based on Crichton's novels. And then, as you know, being the age I am at 19, having Jurassic World kind of like bring that franchise back up for my generation and inspiring a lot of what I did through... um, my time at college has really kind of cemented that as one of my favorites, I think. So I think it's like, for me, it's more just timing in my life that these films have come out more so than anything else. 
Yeah, because um, the way I'm looking at it is more of a nostalgia take, and you're probably doing that less so because, like you said, you're 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 actually a lot younger than me, which we joke <laughs> about quite often. But um, you know, I I look at a lot of this stuff. Like even I have even nostalgia for it in the moment. Um, you know, like look watching that opening scene right now. I, I get nostalgic for that moment in time, like when I saw that yeah. for the first time in the theaters, and I'm like, "Wow, that was that was good." Even though I was, I was unsure, you know, when the moment was done, once once the film was done, I was unsure. But uh, right now, looking back on it, I'm like, "Man, that was that was a good time. That was that was really awesome." Watching that whole thing, uh, f- you know, hearing the score for the first time, uh, analyzing that. There's there's a lot of nostalgic moments for this film now. And uh, I really, I really, really do enjoy it. Yeah, I think that's nice. I think that's a nice note to kind of end talking about the film and, yeah, all the experiences yeah. we've had with it. And kind of now, obviously, everything that we're going to talk about next has really come about because of the film. Yeah, well, But also we... because Universal seemed to actually want to keep some longevity going and kind of keep things going in between the space now until the next film, which is really exciting. Yeah. I mean, of course the promotion um, for this movie was out of control. Like I yeah. think somewhere, I forget what the numbers were, but they had spent like the, some of the most amount of money ever on a budget for promotion. Wasn't and it like the cost of Jurassic world got spent on marketing alone for Fallen Kingdom? Maybe. I, I don't know. Crazy like that. It was, it was pretty, yeah, pretty big. And um, it showed, you know, the, the fact that they had, the T Rex statues like everywhere. Yeah. They had um they had that Lego blue statue. They had events and all kinds of stuff. Amazon was running tons of promotions with that giant cargo box which <laughs> yeah. which had the T Rex inside of it. Um but there was so much going on uh promotion wise and you saw the trailer everywhere. Um it was it was incredible leading up to that movie. And I after think- it too, I guess. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely continued onwards. But I think for me, it was really quite incredible seeing all of that unfold. So um, right around when the T-Rex statue started coming out, they were obviously doing the big piece with Amazon over stateside for you guys. Yeah. So you had that massive box going across the states on the trailer. It ended up in LA, didn't it, for the premiere? Yeah. Yeah. out in front of that beautiful looking building with the t-rex the big box everything like that the big ceremony to reveal it was really cool um and here in the uk they did something very similar to what they did for jurassic world so for jurassic world they decorated waterloo station as if it was a train station on isla nublar where there was like a gift shop the Velociraptors busting out of the container, that massive statue that's now at the exhibition, um, everything like that. And for it in London this time around, they decorated King's Cross Station, which is in the heart of London. They had um, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom logos everywhere, cardboard cutouts of compies, um, vines, like loads of really nice kind of prehistoric texturing all across the building. They had the the trailer playing on screens posters in places obviously the massive t-rex statue um they had a gyrosphere that people could sit in and get a photo in and they also had like universal reps handing out limited edition posters and um limited edition lego sets as well which was really really cool so they did like all of that huh. and then um that also carried into london comic con which was mdf um obviously some of you guys listening will have seen the video I did on the podcast YouTube channel, but I don't know if you've seen that. Um, so they had that gyrosphere there as well, and it then actually got transferred to King's Cross afterwards. So it was really cool to have seen synergy in their marketing and seeing um, Jurassic get a very, very physical appearance in places this year. And I really think that that kind of like physical, almost publicity stuff is the way to go. Um and actually, I don't know if you remember it, Brad, but in a similar vein to the Amazon thing, in the UK, we got something very similar where there was down the River Thames in London, um, <laughs> where it was really, really cool. I think the Metropolitan Police helicopter unit and some other people were tweeting about it. So they got everyone who's like 
influential with in London, involved in that and engaged with it, which was really cool. So I think they did a really good job at kind of really getting the brand out there. Yeah, I I was just blown away. Like, and you could tell that they definitely spent a lot of money and um, it was funny. It was just funny seeing all this stuff happen. None of it happened where I was. I, London seemed to get heavy, heavy promotion, I guess yeah, due to the fact that, you know, the production took place out there. Um, it, it seems like this this Jurassic World franchise is getting a lot of love over your side of the uh, the world there. So, um, and certainly, I guess, here out in California and stuff like that, but little elsewhere, I think. Yeah, I think that's quite fair to say. Um, I think on the subject of it getting a lot of love here, actually, it's quite a nice opportunity for us to step back because obviously someone from the UK and someone from Australia were quite influential in a lot of that. Um, So Jack Ewins and Timothy Glover, who did Masrani Global and you might have to remind me what the website before that was. Um, Uh, But basically that... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, can you remember which one the one I before think it was? I Patel Corp or something like that, right? Yes, that's it. You're right. Yeah, that's literally the one thing I always forget. But yeah, so those guys who did those websites did the viral marketing for um, the first Jurassic World film back in 2015, came back with the Dinosaur Protection Group, which was another whole separate element of the promotion, which was incredibly immersive, um, incredibly intuitive in terms of how it got fans involved and it like gave people a lot of opportunities to actually interact with the brand and really get hands-on with what was occurring within the storyline which I really think is something quite special and actually this kind of interactive marketing there's only really two other brands that do it which is Godzilla um, and the MonsterVerse and the Cloverfield films and beyond those you don't really see this level of interactive marketing so I think that's something that's quite special for the promotional side of things as well. Yeah it is surprising how much uh, that is not used these days. Uh, there there has been a lot of films and TV shows in the past but you'd think it'd be used a lot more than it is um, yeah. but it's, it's pretty awesome that uh, the, the team, the full team there at Chaos Theorem um, which is what they go under now, um, you know, produce some awesome stuff for the DPG. You also had uh, Manuel Bayarano. Um, hopefully I said his name right. And uh, they even opened it up. I think like Sam Phillips and Ross Lane and even Yaroslav was included this time around yeah. with the artwork and stuff like that. So that was that was awesome. The DPG artwork and, and the look of the site, everything – uh, was was incredible. It just felt really in world. I think they did a great job of creating, you know, um, a, a, a team that felt real. You know, something about the DPG felt real. Whether it was the news articles, the images, uh, or wh- whatever it may be, it really felt real. And I think they did a great job of incorporating that into the the lore of the franchise, answering questions, um, yeah. you know, giving us new answers, new new things that we can kind of dive into. And there was a lot, man. There was a lot of text <laughs> yeah. to go through, a lot of stuff to read. I still feel like I'm 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 discovering stuff and not fully comprehending it all. But I have it all um, saved, so I have it like an archive, so I can go in there oh, and check it at any plan. point. But um, it is a great source of material for the fans, and I think it'll. It'll create years of, of um, insight, I guess, for us all to kind of dive into. I think it's really nice as well because I have always said, um, so I was actually talking to Jack the other day because we're, obviously you know Brad, but anyone listening won't know, we're currently in the process of sorting out a little interview with them, which will be really nice. Um, but when we were talking the other day, I brought up how a lot of what they've done has kind of influenced what I do for marketing. And I think that it's really interesting because you look at what Godzilla, King of the Monsters, which is quite a current almost dinosaur film for a lot of fans of Jurassic, there's that overlap there. Um, What they're doing with their like Monarch Sciences Twitter account and things like that really parallels what was done with the DPG and beforehand. So it really feels like, I don't know, other big companies are starting to notice how Jurassic has been incredibly smart with its marketing and they're starting to like, get in on that which i like i think um 
when it's a creative industry, especially film, it's always so much more fun and worthwhile when fans actually feel a part of the process and feel like they can get immersed in it. So again, as you're saying, it was absolutely fantastic that the DPG allowed people to do that. Yeah. Um, and to the extent that like, you could, um, at one point, you could adopt a dinosaur oh, and yeah. get put in for a giveaway for a t-shirt, couldn't you? Which was really cool. That was really awesome. I, I did love that. It gave your little picture um, on top of like a, a bigger picture of a dinosaur and you could adopt it. That was so cute. I did one for like me and for my son. It was awesome. Yeah. I yeah. I found mine the other day because I've been putting together a video that I'm going to put on my Twitter just to show you what I've got to do this year. And I remember I adopted the Apatosaur of all oh, dinosaurs. Nice. Um, and I think I did that because the Brachiosaur wasn't on there, but you inspired me to adopt a sauropod. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That 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 whole DPG stuff was amazing. They also did um, Extinction Now, uh, which was like the opposing yes. view. That didn't get as much love, but it was still really cool. Um, and it also uh, included that amazing like brand new shot of the t-rex um in san diego which was really really cool yeah that was wicked i absolutely to be honest i think a lot there's been like a very mixed opinion on how much stuff is being added retroactively so you see a lot of people who say they feel like it's just done to like appease fans or whatever but Mm. i absolutely love it i think it's fantastic that we actually get to go back and look at these things in different contexts though and actually really think about things um, yeah yeah i do love and, that being able to look back on the time finding notes and articles and videos from the the old time periods of the old old films and stuff is is incredible you know to see um a part of the pamphlet that was like from um roland tembo's hand you know you find yeah. it in the book or in the uh, on the website here the the rest of the the pages there that's awesome to see like that included that video that i mentioned there is so many cool pieces here and they just did a phenomenal job at bringing them all to life making them feel real and in world but i i agree a lot of people um have issues with the the time jumps and the things that the movies are missing and yeah. while while this website and everything is great sometimes it's it's bad for people that don't visit this stuff don't really take it all in no fault to them or anything like that, but um, you know the movies. I guess you could fault for not including more information, but I think the DPG, the Mizrani site, the Extinction Now stuff is a great way to include that material for the fans that want to seek it out. Because if you're questioning it, there is a way to find it. Yeah, I think that's a really nice thing to say. Basically, that there is stuff out there, and I think that. Um, you know, in his recent interview with Jurassic Outpost, Colin Trevorrow. I never know if I say his surname right. I think it's Trevorrow. I, um, I say Trevorrow. <laughs> Trevorrow. Okay. <laughs> I. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to have to like, Colin, if for some reason you're listening to this episode, even though it's going to be a completely disordered and jumbled episode, please correct me. Um, but yeah, I was going to say it's really nice because in that interview, he really spoke about how important he feels it is to empower the fans and to really let the fans help shape the universe. And I think in some ways that means that for diehard fans who actually do go out there and search for things, there's a lot more stuff out there than there used to be, which is absolutely fantastic. And it kind of feels like the days of um, the old JP forums and everything have finally added up to something and they finally got to a point where all these community members again to get more actively involved in things as things grow and develop which is really nice mm-hmm. yeah yeah um let's see what else do we have here um oh i wanted to touch on this one point that, that malcolm statue which i'm still that slightly really confused bizarre. about like i still don't understand what what that was about really it was for promotion for some tv show or something do you want me to explain it yeah because it was on your side of the water there so i have no idea (laughs) it was really weird because it kind of popped up out of nowhere um i did get in touch with the artist who made it i can't remember if we put an article up or if i forgot to follow it up i have a horrible feeling i forgot to follow it up Um, but basically it was done as a promotional piece for now tv which is a television service in the uk similar to um netflix almost so you can kind of get television on demand i think they do live telly um 
Okay. But generally speaking, it doesn't seem to have taken off as much as other services. So I think that was kind of them seeing that there was hype for Jurassic at the time and them just finding a way to tie in their marketing to the fact that Jurassic Park would be coming to Now TV at a time where people were very much into the franchise. So I just kind of, from a marketing standpoint, it was jumping in on that trend, which makes a lot of sense. And that's kind of how that came about. Okay, yeah. It was very confusing just being like, oh, well, there's this giant um, Malcolm statue out there with his chest, you know, bearing for the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the entire country over there. Like, it, it was it was very interesting, and I really didn't know what it was about. So I'm sure a lot of people felt the same way. I would be very happy to see it end up in a pub somewhere as a permanent decoration. <laughs> the thing looked pretty massive. Was it really, <laughs> like, that big? Um, I didn't get up there, but I know that my friend Colette made it up there. Um, from the photos I saw that she posted, it did look huge. Okay, and it yeah. was entirely like fenced off, so people could go and climb on it or anything as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, I'm sure we're missing a whole lot of stuff as far as promotions concerned. Um, but that's just some of the highlights there. But I think, yeah. I think they did a great job. The movie made a ton of money. Um, it was. I think it was fairly well received, even though it's, you know, divisive amongst the fans. But I think it was fairly well, well received, um, even sometimes better than Jurassic World. Um, sometimes not. But uh, for the most part, I felt like it was well received. Yeah, I feel like it was well received. And I think for better or worse, yes, it's highlighted some areas where fan interaction could be better and where more could be done. But ultimately, it's got more people talking about the brand, and it's added brand longevity that this brand really has not had before. Like, when Jurassic World came out, you saw talk about the films very quickly fizzle out afterwards. This time, that's simply not happening, because no. promotion and mm. energy is continuing to be invested into the brand continuously after the film's released, and I think that that's only going to benefit this in the long run. It's going to keep people talking about Jurassic it's a really really positive thing yeah we're six months from the film's release and they're still they're still hyping it they're still hyping the product um which is amazing to see that still happening uh they they haven't forgot about it we're not the only ones talking about it here on the podcast so that is a good feeling you know to see um big steps taken to take us seriously um as fans and uh the yeah. community as a whole and and stuff like that so it is it is really interesting. I, I do wish Universal would take more steps to include the community. It is great that yeah. they're, they're taking fans and helping to build something, but to include the community, the people who are not taking part in those things, I really think Universal needs to step up and do something a little bit more in that sense because they've sort of dropped the ball when it comes to that. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. I think um, mainly, yeah, just like... I think the biggest highlight for this year, unfortunately, was the JP25 event and how short notice that was. But I think, again, you know, it's things they've not done before. So you're always going to have like teething issues where you try and figure out the best way to do things. But I'm just, I'm hoping that they'll be taking note of things as they occur. They'll be seeing how many people turn up to different things what kind of things the community want and they'll really start working towards them. I think, you know, they've got time. They know that this brand is popular, so really there's no reason not to be doing that. Yeah, well, you know, the JP25 event was certainly something that was well-received. Um, you know, a lot of people went to that. I, I bet you they could have had a lot more visitors than they did if they did give us a little bit more time, unfortunately. And um, I think it was about a month's notice, and that was just a real shame because that's a once-in-a-lifetime experience, you know, Going out to uh, Universal Studios Hollywood, getting the chance to ride that ride potentially for one of your last visits, um, getting to see the first five minutes of Fallen Kingdom, getting to see Jurassic Park in the theater out there, um, visiting with all these fans, seeing Colin Trevorrow, you got Jeff Goldblum, Laura Dern, um, so many other people that were out there at that, uh, the creators and the actors and stuff like that from the franchise. Um, that was really a once in a lifetime experience and they definitely dropped the ball by not um, releasing more information about that earlier, giving more people time to uh, make the trip. Cause yes, some people did travel out there, but a majority of people came from California 
and just travel. Mm. They were regular park goers. They were people like that that just so happened to pick up a ticket um, to the event. But um, unfortunately, it wasn't properly announced, which they've done, unfortunately, with a few different things throughout the year. But, you know, like you said, I guess it's a teething ex- experience, but they definitely have other franchises to learn from that are doing it properly that are not having Star these issues. Wars. Yes, they're yeah. not having these <laughs> issues. So there is the model there for them to learn from. And I just I just feel like sometimes they don't care about that aspect of following in the model. But um, maybe they're trying to create their own path, I guess. But um, in my eyes, it's not necessarily working for a fan experience. <clears throat> no. I would agree with that. And I would say that at this point, we'll just have to wait and see what 2019 brings. I think in terms of Jurassic, you've got a completely empty calendar for 2019. So there's the potential to do some interesting stuff. And I think if it's well planned, if it happens, it will be really good. But equally, if not, it's all good because, you know, we've got our own mini podcast get together at Jen and Josh's wedding. So whatever happens, there's going to be some Jurassic fans hanging out in 2019. (laughs) Yeah, that's the thing. We got to do it ourselves. Um, I I think I sent you a gift once about Thanos saying, look, I got to do it myself. Um, Yeah. Grab the (laughs) glove. You know, that's that's the way it feels sometimes when the the franchise is not connecting with the audience as much as it could. So you got to do things yourself. And I think the fan base, the community has done a great job of doing that. Yeah, I'd agree with that 100%. I think there's been some fantastic meetups. Um, And for anyone in the UK who's listening, if you want to hang out and get together at the Natural History Museum in London sometime, I know last time not a lot of people came because we were buying tickets for Fallen Kingdom as well. And it was a bit awkward to like do transactions and everything over the internet. And I feel like that really puts some people off. So if you just want to come down, hang out at the museum, have a good time, go and get a drink after, let me know. And I'm always up for doing that. I'm always up for hanging out with people in the UK who are Jurassic fans. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't have any museums near me, so I got to go like an hour. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Brad will go on an hour's road trip with you. Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, I think on that note, we've kind of like talked a lot about kind of the promotion and how everything has got fans involved. Why don't we Why don't we hit uh, on the DVD real quick? Um, since we're yeah. sort of in that line, um, the DVD released and uh, you you guys got it out in uh, the UK. Oh, what was that? don't start. How How don't much start. longer was that, that that you got it than us? I think it was. A I think month? it was like a month. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's interesting. I think we got it in October and you got it in November. No, that- you got it in September. We got oh. it in October. Oh, okay. All right. One, one, yeah. one month off there. Whoops. Um, <laughs> you were but close. It's all good. Very close. The, I thought the, the promotion for the DVD was pretty good. Um, a lot of stuff on TV. They got the people out in the stores to do the VR, like the little VR experience, or AR, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> augmented reality. You could see blue. You could see the Indoraptor, all that kind of stuff. Blue was like included in the package. The Indoraptor was like on a stand in the store there was a few different exclusives nothing too crazy um personally i think the target one was probably the best one because it had some extra bonus features what one that is oh wait you just said my bad it's just it just had it just had like um some extra artwork and then um the bonus features on an extra dvd which i'm sure at this point you could probably find on youtube yeah yeah to be fair that is the that actually does highlight the one unfortunate thing for these dvd releases i think um you don't tend to generally and this isn't just jurassic this is kind of the dvd industry as a whole Mm -hmm. it feels like you don't get as many behind the scenes features as you used to and i think it would be really special to like see some of the set decorations and stuff like that so i'm just going to pull up my instagram quickly actually because i know i followed someone that chris recommended the other day um and i'll see if i can find him if he's still in my recent search history but there was a a gentleman who was on um what's his name i think oh i i know who you're talking about Um... do you know yeah so there was um that guy who a few people have followed now, and I know his name's out there if you guys want to find him, um, who was actually on set and Some, got a bunch of behind-the-scenes photos. Something's I see 
is is his uh handle on instagram oh is it wicked yes. well let me pull it up quickly because i i was gonna say i think like um i think i followed him on this account I yeah, know, maybe it, it was my other account. It was a nice um, little surprise, like here in December, to have like some some extra production photos from like the Lockwood Mansion. Like, it was nice to kind of see that stuff. Yeah. So it's Andy Nicholson who was a production designer on Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom, and he was kind of sharing some photos of, as Brad said, the Lockwood Museum. So it's the um, creatures like the iguanodon, the um, a juvenile Diplodocus, which I don't think we've actually had confirmed as being a proper in-gen species until now, which is quite interesting. Um, well, uh, that Diplodocus doesn't necessarily in- that doesn't necessarily mean it was an in-gen species. Um, so, I mean, it just it was just a statue. Yeah, yeah, that is true. The Concavenator and a, a few other species but he really shared a behind the scenes look at some of those sets and locations which is really really beautiful to see and i think it's a shame that the behind the scenes um really didn't highlight those because i think there was a lot of potential to kind of showcase some of the absolutely incredible sets that get built for these films and i think it's actually always the case unfortunately that a lot of work goes in behind the scenes on jurassic and we don't ever see much behind the scenes beyond the star power Mm -hmm. yeah and like don't get me wrong chris pratt and bryce dallas howard are amazing actors and i like it when we see them behind the scenes but i i as someone who's interested in the film industry, I really enjoy seeing all the different elements behind the scenes as well. Well, yeah, the problem with the DVDs is that they decide to include all those like Jurassic journals that were already released online. Actually, a majority, yeah. uh, uh, it felt like a majority of the the uh, behind the scenes stuff was already viewed online, whether it was a small portion of it or the entire thing. You saw it all already. Like I said with the trailers, you saw it all. So it didn't necessarily need to be included on the DVD. If it's on YouTube, it's on YouTube. Just go track it down, which, yeah, exactly. you know, I know a lot of people are, are ripping these things and putting them on YouTube nowadays. But if it's on the official account, like there it is. You don't need to include it on a DVD. So, I mean, nobody's going to listen to me because this is just a standard of practice, like you said, for any movie these days is to just include the superfluous like stuff on the DVDs. It's not as in depth as it used to be. I was actually a little bit more happy with these ones than I was with Jurassic World. I thought they were a little bit more in depth. Um, There was like a little decent sequence on the Lockwood Manor and stuff like that, showing it all built on that set. Like, and you're right. The production design was incredible. And that um, Andy Nichols Nicholson, was it? Yeah. Yeah, Uh, yeah. He, you know, like the stuff that he showed there, like just really highlights the details of everything it was really really beautiful it really looked like a true little museum and and stuff like that i i loved it i think a lot of fan love went into the lockwood manor as well and that's why it's a shame that a lot of those exhibits aren't better highlighted because when you look at them there are actually a lot of dinosaurs like the dimetrodon Mm -hmm. that um people have wanted to see officially confirmed as canon that have main, like maybe only appeared in games and things like that. So there really were a lot of nice nods to the fans tucked into those museum maquettes and displays that just didn't make it through. Like I think the biggest one, the Velociraptor versus the Dilophosaurus, um, is one of the only ones that you actually see in the film. But that, again, shows a massive nod to the fans and that actually things that we say we want to see is heard and while it doesn't necessarily fit into their sequence of what these films want to do, they do at least try to sometimes acknowledge the fans and what the fans want, um, even if it's not perhaps in the medium that they're expecting it to be acknowledged in. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, you can't get everything that you want, so this is a great way to include it in stuff like this. Um, I mean, you have the amazing uh, John Hammond artwork in there. Um, there's just so many subtle touches in there that are just really beautiful, and yeah, I think um, behind the scenes stuff really needs that time to focus on a lot of these things. You know, slow panning shots, not quick cuts, because a lot of these DVD features are just very quick, like highlights or or just really high, highlight reels of the movie and then people explaining them, which is not really what we want as fans. You know, we want like the actual production behind the scenes, you know, them saying action and cut and all that stuff. We want yeah. that <laughs> from beginning to end. We want to see 
what went in there. We just want to see the whole thing. Stuff. We want to see like a massive DVD box set of every single day spent filming, like every single moment that happened. Well, yeah, basically. I mean, we we definitely <laughs> we definitely do want that. But you know, in, in terms of how how things have been done in the past, we want something along those lines. You know, like what they used to do with the old series. So it, it would be nice to have, you know, a little bit more. But I, I can't I can't fault it too much because it's just the way the industry goes now. Yeah, it is a shame, and I think like while you said Jurassic World didn't have many great bits, one thing it did really well, and one thing that I still watch from time to time because I find it fascinating, was explaining how they made the weapons for the ACU. So they explained how one of the semi-automatic dart rifles didn't actually exist, and they created this weapon that had lots of functional features, so it felt like a real firearm. Uh And then how they made the shock sticks... And then um, they also touched on how um, the creatures were made as well, which was really, really interesting. So I think things like that, that still do get included, there's definitely more room for those kinds of things. Yeah. So let's see, what else can we move on to here? We've got a whole lot of stuff. (laughs) We've only touched on a small portion. Um, Let's go over to, uh, we'll, we'll continue with some of the promotional items. I know there was like, Surprisingly, a lot of like food and different things like that promotions on them. We had like Dr. Pepper was those like awesome like collectible cans. Everybody was trying to collect them. I'm not too big on collecting the cans. I wish they had done bottles, but uh, that didn't happen this time around. Yeah. Um, but now now we're getting like chicken nuggets, which is great. They're, they're popping up now. That's, that's awesome. Um, Doritos played a big part. Um, did you actually head out to the website and there, cause there was like codes and stuff like that. You could like yes. play like a game on the website <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. It was really fun. Actually. It was a fun little game that entered you into some different prize draws and things. Yeah. Um, and one thing to touch on here is not a food product, but it is promotion. And I realized that we've completely forgot to add it, but it was quite significant. Was good old Barbasol getting involved? Yes, Responsible yes. for, um, obviously, Nedry's can. And I believe they sent you and Jurassic Unicar some samples, didn't they? Yeah, because it, it was pretty late in the process. I, I forget exactly. I think it was around the DVD release. Um, yeah. they actually decided to finally pop up with some new, uh, cans. So they had the Indominus or Indominus, man, I'm still doing that six months <laughs> later. Um, the, <laughs> the, the Indoraptor and, uh, blue, and they were awesome. They're, they're very cool cans. And they, they sent out like a full little package and stuff like that. Cause they had like a, a shave club that you could join and stuff. So yeah, it was great to finally see that. I was wondering, like, the entire lead-up to Fallen Kingdom, I'm like, come on, Barbasol, where are these cans? Like, are you going to ever release new shaving cream cans? Because they were such a big hit with Jurassic World, I would have assumed. And I was like, oh, I guess they're not doing it. And then finally they reached out, and they're like, here, we, we got some new ones. I'm like, yes, finally. I think, yeah, they did a really nice job with them. I'm not going to lie. I tried to get some of them, but I was not successful. <laughs> um, but from what I saw, they looked really, really cool. And I think that um, it's just a nice piece of legacy marketing, to be honest, because even if, like, the Barbasol cans don't appear um, in the films anymore, it's just a nice tribute to where it's come from and exactly. a storyline that hasn't actually ever been resolved. It, it is really funny. 25 years later, they're still they're still pumping it out. You know, like well, that's really, really awesome that they're still involved because Barbasol is like an iconic thing when it comes to this franchise, even though it was in the movie for a few minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's it's really awesome that it's still there. And even though Dennis Nedry would lead you to believe that they're food, uh, they're not. You know, do not put them, do not put uh, Barbasol shaving cream on your pies. Um, that's just a, a, you know, a little hint for everybody out there. Don't do it. It won't taste good. <laughs> no it won't yeah um <laughs> i don't know well i mean there's a running joke in the podcast that i can't grow a proper beard so i wouldn't know what shaving cream is anyway well, that's i was going to make that joke before but you skimmed past it quickly i felt like on purpose because you knew i would be like well, the reason you didn't get any is because you can't grow a beard but <laughs> brad what i want to know is when are you using it to shave your Oh, well, you know, I I have used it to shave underneath and on top. So 
that's the only thing I can do at this point. <laughs> okay, I accept that for now. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, did you want to continue? Because you were touching on obviously the homestyle harvest chicken nuggets, the Doritos. Yeah. Well, there. You know, there's not much to really say about all this. There was there was tons of food. I didn't really include everything here, but there was stuff like Kinder eggs, Jelly Bellies, Skittles, Pez. Um, and the the candy is still continuing. It went all the way out through Halloween. They had like, um, like so, I don't even remember what the candy was, but it was like some sort of like Dilophosaurus thing with like a fan on the back. Like that yeah. was really funny. Um, there there was like eggs and all kinds of stuff. Right now, I know it's not food, but there's like bath bombs for, um, uh, I guess the bath and stuff like that. So they look like little eggs that are sh- uh, shaped and colored f- for like different dinosaurs or whatever. So it's really cool. Like the the promotion that they got out there, they've they've gotten to contact with like everybody. Oh, what was um Keebler, I guess. Um, and uh, what was the other? It was like a cereal. I forget what the cereal was, but they did those promotional like sp- limited edition boxes. Um, yeah, I got I got like the um the, I think it was the Keebler like cookie box, and that was really cool because it had like the the behind the scenes playing inside the. The container, which was crazy. <laughs> That's really cool. And, and then wicked. the cereal, the cereal had the same thing. It was like just a cereal box with a video screen in it. And you're like, what is going on? This is so crazy. <laughs> so you can definitely see how they spent as much money as they did. <laughs> yeah. And this, like I'm saying, this is all just like promotional things. We we got like so much else out there that, um, you know, helped build the brand and, and continue the brand. So it's it's very sustainable at this point, I would say. Yeah. I think on the subject of sustainability, that's kind of a nice point to really dive into video games because we've seen a lot more added this year than we have in last year's. And to be honest, I'm really, really excited to talk about one of these. Yeah, where do you want to start? Well, I think we'll we'll get some of the smaller ones out of the way first. Okay. So So Jurassic World Evolution. That's where... (laughs) No, Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> that was kind of what i was going to build up to but you know what yeah we'll, we'll start with evolution yeah. why not no no no, no. So. so let's go with uh <laughs> let's go with um dave and buster's vr because i don't know much about it i just know that dave and buster's which is a big like arcade restaurant chain thing out here for um you know older kids and, and adults and stuff um it's kind of like a bar but like an arcade it, it's interesting um but they have a, a big vr system out there i have never never done it before um i know a lot of people have but it looked really really cool so that was something that popped up um uh, there was another oh yeah so i don't know we got uh jurassic world pinball did you get around to playing that one I didn't, but I know we got both Jurassic World and didn't we get Jurassic Park 25th anniversary as well? Well, yeah, I think it was all under the the Jurassic World pinball. It was all like one game, so you could just pick and choose like which ones you wanted to play. There was like, I think, three different modes. Um, Yeah. Yeah, there was like two like classic Jurassic ones and then there was like a Jurassic World one. They were they're very awesome. I still enjoy really playing those. They're they're good fun. I am quite tempted to pick them up, actually. I know they're quite cheap on the Xbox store, so might play them over Christmas. You never know. Do it. Yeah, they're they're a blast. They're beautiful looking. I mean, they're you know they're simple, very simple games. They're very fun, but they have some nice little nods to the fans and stuff like that. A lot of audio cues and stuff. So it's it's real, real fun. Yeah, wicked. Well, that's definitely something to pick up then. Um, I think the next one and the one which probably you have more experience with than I do because I have like no space on my phone for anything (laughs) is Jurassic World Alive um which has definitely taken the world by storm it's kind of hopped onto the trend of Pokemon Go and given it a Jurassic twist yeah um I do still see people playing Pokemon Go um but you know I haven't actually seen a lot of people playing Jurassic World Alive outside of the fan community i guess but i have no i have no idea what the interest is outside of that but um it's been it's been a blast like i've really really enjoyed that game um just a simple mobile game that you go and track down your your dinosaurs and you have to get like dna and coins and and all kinds of stuff like that there's little battles you can battle against people you know you can also battle against just the the simulator itself um but you essentially just build up your dinosaur um you know, uh, uh, I guess 
I don't know, just like a a, a, a park. F- no, it's not. It's not really. It's not really. A, I guess they're, they're considering you part of the DPG, and you're um, supposed to be tracking down these dinosaurs and just getting their DNA and stuff like that. So you're not. You're not like shooting the dinosaurs. It's. I mean, you are. It's just like a trank dart or something like that. So you're going out and like tranking them for DNA samples or something like that. And you've got a giant collection of dinosaurs. Um, you can also create your hybrids and stuff like that. Um, and like I said, you can battle and, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. They've actually really kept with it. They've updated it a lot. They've added, uh, you know, flying reptiles and stuff like that. Now it's on like a winter mode. So there's like gifts all over the place that you can like get extra bonus stuff. Um, so there's a lot going on with the game. They really seem to be keeping up with it. I'm glad it hasn't died out. Um, I wonder what the life cycle will be for the, uh, you know, this game, but it seems like uh, with like um, Jurassic World, the game, that one that they had last time around, that life cycle was pretty long. It was, it was probably it's, still it's probably going, still going. It? Yeah, I I don't yeah. know. I know they were they were updating updating it even with like the the release of the movie, but I don't know if anything has done since then. But so I, I think it could go on for a very long time, and and I think it's fun. You got the AR aspect, so you can like look at all these dinosaurs that you can capture in real life surroundings. Um, it's a lot of fun and it's fun to compare with your friends and, and see how many points you can get and how many dinosaurs and all the creations that you can get. Um, it's a lot of, a lot of fun. I think it's interesting as well, cause it's probably more applicable now, given the fallout of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom than it was before, because it's Very now true. literally a case of you're finding dinosaurs in the world which is what people in that universe are now going to start to see. They're going to start to have these spontaneous encounters with all sorts of different creatures. Yeah, it is pretty funny um, that they decided to release it like before the movie and stuff like that. There was like a big discrepancy in the, the release of it because it was released, um, I believe, in like Canada and maybe like some South American countries and maybe somewhere else. I don't know, but it was released for like a, a long time. And the United States, like, didn't get it for a very long time here. I don't know about you guys, but um, it took a long time for it to come to us. And once it did, it was, like, on the Android store for a while. It still took a while to get to the iOS store. But um, once it did, I was, like, playing nonstop. And I I still do pick it up every now and then because it is a good little, like, time waster. You know, when you're out yeah. anywhere, you're like, oh, let me see what kind of dinosaurs are around here. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm like that anyway, you know, I'm just like, oh, are there any dinosaurs here? Oh, no, wait, they're extinct. No, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, the biggest game of the year undoubtedly has to be Jurassic World Evolution. Now, obviously, we're going to talk about this a little bit later when we highlight some of the stuff we've done on the podcast this year, because we had an absolutely fantastic opportunity to do with this game. But... um. I think Jurassic World Evolution is something very special because it's a game that a lot of fans have wanted for a very long time. And while it's slightly different to what fans wanted, it's really a good game to kind of empower people to add their own interpretation to this universe. Yeah, I I totally agree. This is a a park builder that I have been looking for for a very long time. I was never, uh, I never really got a chance to play um, Operation Genesis. I was never into that, uh, you know, option back then for some reason. I don't know why it just like, it missed out on me. Maybe I was playing too much, uh, Sims or something else or roller coaster tycoon. Um, but I just completely missed out on it. And, um, to finally have a real legit park builder is, is awesome. Um, I think they've done a fantastic job and they're still doing it. They're still including stuff, which is really great to see. And I think it's, it's created its own awesome community as well because you can create all this stuff, compare it with your friends' parks and stuff like that, talk about it, uh, have a lot to discuss. So I've really enjoyed having Jurassic World Evolution you know, in our lives now. It's been really, really fun. I agree with you, and I think that um, it's really, really nice because in all the updates and patches, they've been adding more and more things like more and more tools for the creative sandbox on the East on Nublar and um things like that which is really nice because it just adds a little bit more longevity to it Mm -hmm. um yeah it can because it can get a little repetitive because yeah that's just what it is in nature it's repetitive but you are opening up new things 
So while it's like the same routine, you at least have new dinosaurs and stuff. But I assume, you know, once you get to the end, it's like, well, I don't really, there's not much left to do. And it could get repetitive in that nature. But at least they are adding new routines, new new dinosaurs, new skins, new stuff like that. So they're keeping uh, keeping up with it. And it's been a lot of, there's been a lot of free updates and stuff like that. But there's been some paid ones, paid ones as well. And I think it's going to continue for a very long time. Yeah, I do as well. And I think a lot of that is down to the energy of the community team. Like, again, this is something that we'll talk about a little bit later when we highlight what we got to do to do with the game. But I think um, the community team now are in a really good place where there's five people at Frontier who are community managers. And they've just done a really, really fantastic job of running competitions sharing content actually interacting with fans and really getting people excited about this game and kind of addressing concerns and at the same time keeping this game alive for people keeping people invested in it and i think that um it's one thing that for sure we're happy to have a new jurassic world game but i think actually we're really really lucky that somebody like frontiers ended up being at the helm of this game because they're one of the most interactive game companies I think I've seen in my experience as a gamer. Yeah, and it, it's great because where Universal and as a, you know as a brand for Jurassic kind of you know has some faults, Frontier and people like Colin Trevorrow and and others are really picking up the slack. And Frontier has done a wonderful job of interacting, creating that sustainability by having um, you know amazing tweet interactions and. Um, uh, you know, contests, promotional videos, like they're, they're releasing videos for their new content, their new dinosaurs all the time. There's YouTube stuff, there's live streams, there's, there's so much going on for evolution. And, um, I think they've done a wonderful job at keeping it present in everybody's mind. Yeah. I think on the subject of a lot of stuff going on for evolution, before we touch on a couple of the new DLCs, um, can can I share a little teaser on what I've been working on, Mr. Trost? Go ahead, yeah, why not? We're almost there. So <laughs> I have been working on a series for 2019, which is going to be called Jurassic World Evolution Build a Dream. It's a 10-part series, which takes the form of nine 20 to about 25-minute episodes. I think episode nine goes a little bit over because I was wrapping stuff up. And it culminates itself in a six-minute cinematic episode, which is episode 10, um, which really kind of showcases my first experience of getting behind the sandbox in the game. So in the game, Isla Nublar is the brand-new sandbox map. Uh, where you can go and basically visualize your own Jurassic World. So I had a lot of fun turning off all the restrictions and just really recording my first time sitting down and playing on that sandbox and getting really creative with how I envisioned my park. Um, So that is a series that, as Brad knows, I've put a lot of work into because I mucked up my first Jurassic World Evolution series (laughs) like two (laughs) episodes done. Um, So this time I really wanted to kind of go back to the drawing board, come up with an idea for a series which would highlight how fantastic this game really is and ultimately produce a piece of frequent content which will give you guys a nice series to kind of tune into on our YouTube channel for a couple of months. So um, if everything goes according to plan, uh, we will hopefully be dropping that in January 2019. So that's something to look forward to. And we've got a full-length trailer which will be dropping soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that because that's been a lot of fun to work on. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, hopefully I, people really are going to enjoy it. I had an absolute blast putting it together and it really kind of, it showed me some of the flaws of the game, but also some of the areas where I actually think the game's really, really well done. Um, and yeah. above all else, it really highlighted to me just how beautiful the dinosaurs in the game are, which is what you want them to be. They're the main focus of the game. Exactly. I think I think they've done a great job of getting the, the things they needed to get good, uh, get them right, perfect. Like the dinosaurs, they're they so beautiful. Um, and even the, the different colors and skins that you can add, they're, they're awesome. I, I'm still surprised every time I like change a skin or change the DNA and I'm like, wow, this thing looks amazing. Like yeah. I know it's like a simple skin, but the, 
the T-Rex where you can get like that sort of like a black coat and like a red striping or something. It looks yeah. incredible. And it's just one of the simpler ones. It's awesome. And they've, they've done a great job of getting these things right. And, and everything looks perfect. Um, yeah, there are some faults, of course. I think they could do a better job at creating a unique identity for these parks. They do sort of seem a little sterile at times. Um, and yeah, I, I think there could be some more um, enhancements to the park outside of dinosaurs and shops and, and stuff like that. I think there needs to be a little bit more on that front, whether it's roller coasters or other other park attractions to create a cohesive theme park because they've done an amazing job with Planet Coaster. Um, I think they should just add a little bit of variable in there where it comes to uh, a, a roller coaster or some other kind of theme park attraction. I think it would be very good for them to handle that at least. Yeah, I'd almost like it as a little tribute to the amazing community that Frontier has from both Elite Dangerous and Planet Coaster. If we got like a Planet Coaster inspired DLC, I don't know. I don't think that's something that Universal would ever let happen, to be honest, because it's a bit of a cross in the two franchises. Yeah. But I think it would be really a fun tribute to kind of the roots of the studio and some of the other projects they've worked on. Now, obviously, when I say Roots, that is one of their more recent projects, but it would still be a nice throwback to incorporate some of the fantastic stuff that that game does. Because that game, honestly, has got so many features in it, and I'm absolutely gutted that there isn't a console port of it, because it looks incredible. So, you know what? I'm going to throw a little freebie out for Universal and uh, and Frontier as well. You know, you got a lot of theme park updates coming um, you have uh, a, new, a new ride coming in the near future. <laughs> hey guys, do a little themed ride. You know, get get that ride in there to be very similar to what's going to come in Universal Hollywood. So that way, it's a it's a lovely little tie-in. You know, you create a little screen in there that says, "Hey, check out our new ride at Universal Studios Hollywood." Even though it's a it's a UK company, Frontier and all, um, I think it would be great to have that brand recognition and promotion for for real life stuff. And then they could have also the like the because it's the, the the attraction out in California is going to be a boat ride still. So just mm-hmm. have that ported over to um, the game as well. Very similar in structure and layout. Um, you could have that because back in the day, Roller Coaster Tycoon had a mod or a a, a, a DLC where you could add. Six Flags coasters to oh, your wow. to your console. So yeah, you could you could build your own coasters and stuff like that. But then you could add some of the awesome coasters that you've ridden before. So I think that is a perfect way to tie into things. And you know, down the line, we might be getting a new coaster and stuff like that in in Orlando and and other where uh, other places like that. Like there needs to be more. They've got the awesome Gyrosphere yeah. addition to that park in Frontiers game. Um, so add, keep building, keep building, tie it into the real life stuff that's going on. I think that would be a great way to, to continue that promotion. I agree a hundred percent. I think it would be really, really interesting to have more elements of that added into it. And it would also make the parks a lot more divisive and it would help them to look a lot different because at the moment, um, while I have nothing but love for this game, to be honest, and I'm a bit of a fanboy, I do acknowledge that a lot of the parks tend to end up looking the same because all of the features are the same. So if you were able to have um, an area that's just fully roller coasters because you've got loads of roller coasters to choose from, then it would really open up your options in terms of what you could position and where you mm-hmm. can position it. Yes. And I think it is important to note that Jurassic World uh, did have both roller coasters. There was a Terrasaur roller coaster ride planned for the first Jurassic Park in Universe which was the Pterosaur Treetop attraction. And um, Jurassic World also had the water park. So there is definitely more room to have more amenities in your parks. Yes, yes. Yeah, and and knowing that Universal is a theme park industry as well, it, it just makes sense, you know? To, yeah. To even include other things that are part of the real-life world would be awesome. Yeah, I agree 100%. But, yeah, so why don't we move on to some of the, the new things that they're actually updating. You've gotten a chance to play Secrets of Dr. Wu, right? No. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, well, um, yeah. you're not as bored no. as I thought, so <laughs> neither have I. I have not gotten a chance, or the uh, – has has Cretaceous Creatures been released? 
Um, I think it might be out on Xbox and PC, but I That's know right. it was having some but, problems yeah. releasing on PS4. Not PS4, um, yeah, yeah. So I have not played either of those. It doesn't seem like you have either, but they are pretty worthy, um, you know, um, additions to the franchise, I think. Yeah, so um, I'll kind of highlight what they add since I've written the articles on both of them of on the website, so I'm quite well informed about them. Um, one thing I would say quickly is I was explaining to Brand before we actually did this, I would own them and I would be playing them and making content on them. But unfortunately, I broke my phone recently because I'm an idiot and I can now only afford to make rent and transport to work this week. So needless to say, I am a little bit done until Christmas in terms of picking things up. But um, <laughs> So the Secrets of Dr. Wu DLC is basically a hybrid focus DLC. So it focuses on the idea that Dr. Wu is experimenting with different genomes. Obviously, he makes the Indoraptor, he makes the Indon... Uh, blah, blah, blah. There we go. That's a dinosaur, Brad. Did you know that? <laughs> um, so he makes the Indoraptor, he makes the Indominus, and then in this DLC, he makes the... Ankylodocus, I think? <laughs> yeah. Or it yeah. might be the other way around. Um, he makes that, he makes a Spinoraptor, and he also makes the... <laughs> I can remember the two dinosaurs, I can't remember the name. It's a Triceratops and a Stegosaurus combined. So uh, it Stegoceratops. is a Stegoceratops, there we go, um, that we actually see on the screen in Wu's lab in Jurassic World. So this is really a hybrid focused DLC. It adds those three brand new dinosaurs. It adds more space on two of the islands. I believe Isla Muerta is one of them and possibly Isla Pena, although I can't remember for sure which two islands it is. It also um, adds a bunch of new genetic options so you can now make your Indominus Rex able to camouflage and go invisible, which is awesome. Um, there's more genetic modifications to kind of fine tweak a lot of the behaviors of some of the dinosaurs. And there's also a couple of buildings thrown in. Like I think there's a larger, um, a larger storm defense station in there. Although I think that may have just been part of the update. So those are all kind of the elements added in the sequence of Dr. Wu DLC. And then in the Cretaceous Creatures DLC, we get the absolutely beautiful Iguanodon added, which is an amazing dinosaur. And it is one which um, is quite synonymous with where I live because it's on the coat of arms for Maidstone, which is a town near where I live. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and <laughs> if you guys have heard me type in there, I'm just pulling up the article I wrote yesterday quickly because I forgot the other two already. We <laughs> also get the <laughs> Dreadnoughtus added, which is a massive seropod. Um, seropod? I did not say the right thing there. I meant to say sauropod. We, we got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, guys, I'm not good at talking for long periods on my own, but there you go. <laughs> I act like I'm the person who knows everything about these DLCs, but clearly not. But yeah, um, it adds the Dreadnoughtus, which is a brand new sauropod, so that takes our sauropod count up to, I believe, around six sauropods in the game. And we also get the Carcaron... Oh my god, I tried to say this last night on Skype to someone and it didn't work. Is it the like Car the Carcarodontosaurus? <clears throat> yeah. Carcarodontosaurus, there we go, which is another carnivorous dinosaur. So, three new dinosaurs added. I believe people think that the cost for this will be similar to the extra dinosaur pack um, if you didn't pre order Jurassic World Evolution. So, it's not going to be a massively expensive DLC, but it does add some really nice new dinosaurs to the park. So, it's definitely one that I'm going to be picking up just for the iguanodon to be honest because it's such an iconic dinosaur oh yeah yeah i think it's great that they've been servicing the people who want to pay for extra material and also those who who deserve the updates you know because maybe the first option wasn't like the the i don't, don't want to say the greatest but just wasn't fully complete because now they've changed things and they've updated so i think it's great that they're including both sets of people there so I'm excited, though. You know, I have not gotten a chance, like I said, to play these two things, um, but I, I certainly will be. Yeah, me too. I think that, you know, it's just nice to 
it's, to be honest, it's really nice to have more content to bite into and to digest and to enjoy. Um, yeah. As opposed to everything just stopping after June, it's really nice that we're now sitting here in December talking about something else new that's come out. Yeah. So since I touched on the theme parks a tad there, why don't we move on to some of the stuff that's gone on over there? Um, yeah. Like I mentioned, Jurassic Park the ride went down. Um, I think it was the very beginning of September. Um, yeah. We had known for a little while that it was going down. It was still very tough to make it out there. I unfortunately never got a chance to go ever. So I've never been on that version of the ride. I've been on Orlando's version several times. Um, but the Hollywood one, while nearly identical, had some subtle differences. But now it's going to have a lot of big differences because it's transitioning from Jurassic Park the ride to Jurassic World. Uh, I don't know what, what it's going to be called. Um, but, <laughs> um, you know, as of right now, as of this recording, you're, you are seeing like – stuff changing out in in hollywood so you like um i know stephen ray morris was out there recently yes. and he was he was showing some uh instagram stories and stuff like that of like the letters from the the iconic park gates being taken down and you're like oh no what what are you gonna do with those things are you gonna save them please put them in a vault somewhere don't destroy them because that's the unfortunate side effect of you know taking down some of these park attractions sometimes they get thrown in the garbage and sometimes they they get saved so you just never know yeah. what's going to resurface somewhere down the line um but hopefully stuff like this gets saved um i don't know if it will or not and we don't necessarily know what is the incarnation that they're going to do with jurassic world um, well we i <laughs> i i think this is public like i think it's been seen out in public for a while but we know that they've been considering doing a renovation for a very long time. Well, yeah. And the first time they considered one was in 2015 with Jurassic World, where they made a test animatronic of an Indominus fighting a Tyrannosaur, I believe. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure that's public, so I'm not like going to get in any trouble by dropping that. Well, but, um, I mean, it was it, it was released publicly, but not on purpose. It wasn't it wasn't meant to be released. Yeah. So basically. that yeah, that's that's where that stands. It was not anything official. It was unfortunately leaked information. Um, but that could be something that we see up at the top of the ride. So it does seem like um, you know, that they're gonna be going with a Jurassic World timeline, which I think is slightly unfortunate because it dates yeah. the attraction. Um now certainly Jurassic Park is is a, a, a thing of its time. You know, it is dated in itself, but it, it at least created a new version of the story because it wasn't it was not Isla Nublar. You know, you were traveling to its park out in Hollywood or, or Orlando or wherever, and you were experiencing a new version. So essentially the same thing yeah. happened. You know, the park dismantled. You went off course and, um, you know, things broke out. But at least it was a new story. This seems to be. It, like it's going to be a retread. You're going to see stuff maybe from the Mosasaurus. You're going to see the Indominus and stuff like that. So it seems to be a retread of Jurassic World. Hopefully hopefully there's no characters included. That's my hope at least. Hopefully they keep it a clean dinosaur experience. Nothing focused on Claire or Owen or anybody like that. At, at least I hope. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe maybe blue, probably blue. I, I you know, if you want to consider the dinosaur characters, certainly the Indominus is is a character at, in that case. Um, We've definitely but, just worked up some people listening to this who oh, are like, yeah. Brad doesn't think blue is a character. <laughs> oh my god! No, I you know everybody <laughs> knows I know blue is a character. I had a whole episode basically <laughs> devoted to that. Um, but yeah, so that I mean, we don't really know what this is going to take shape in. Um, there has been a lot of. Um, stuff coming out about you know um i don't know about what what else could be out there but as far as this 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 ride is concerned it looks like it might be getting like an enclosure in the beginning of the ride so it might be indoors might be some screens stuff like that so um i don't know the only the only way that the theme park industry seems to be going is to include a lot of screens to um, yeah. immerse you a little bit more while sometimes it's good it is also sometimes pretty bad so hopefully um it's on the good side i don't really know it's going to be interesting to see them go back and forth 
probably between these animatronics and the screens and whatnot. So um, hopefully it looks good. I mean, uh, I'm excited to see what they do. As of right now, there's no confirmed rumors or, or reports really um, as far as the other, the other parks are concerned. Um, we know Universal Beijing, which is going to be a new park, um, is adding more and more and more stuff. So the, the stuff has not been confirmed out there. But there should be an entire Jurassic World land, but that's not going to be for another few years. Um, yeah. But some of that stuff that's in that park might be making its way towards Orlando, um, depending on what route they do take. Since they are going to be adding um, a new park down there, um, a f- fourth gate. So I don't understand where all of this extra space is coming from. <laughs> well, they, they actually bought land from, I believe, Lockheed Martin. So they okay. bought they bought a giant chunk of land down there, um, about two and a half miles away from their current parks. Um, so there's there's big there's a big property which they can add a lot of stuff down there. And and the word right now on the streets is that it's well I mean the leaked images showed it's called um, Fantastic War um, Fantastic Worlds right No yeah Fan- Universal's Fantastic Worlds I believe. Um, I oh, mean, that's oh, not so sounding. That's a lot of potential. It is because you know they're including the worlds, they're including Fantastic, a lot of their franchises, and stuff that they're in 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 cahoots with, like Warner Brothers with Fantastic Beasts will be included. Yeah, um, the Universal Monsters will be included, DreamWorks stuff like that. So the hope is that there will be either a Jurassic Land, a full land with you know, um, new Jurassic World uh, visitor or, you know, uh, whatever it's called, the Innovation Center. Oh, that that. would be so cool to see that realized. Yeah. So, I mean, that is one of the hopes uh, that that could potentially happen because Jurassic World is a big franchise for them. It could pull in a lot of people. But there's also rumors that maybe it won't get its own land. It'll just get a portion of a land and maybe just its own attraction. So who knows? I mean, there, there is the talk about... The wooden coaster, or is it a wooden? No, it might be a steel coaster now. Um, going into uh, Islands of Adventure, so uh, that that park might be staying Jurassic Park, which is a good thing. So, yeah, that would definitely be a good thing. Hopefully, it does stay Jurassic Park. So I think yeah. I think like what you say, like yeah, Jurassic World dates it. Um, it does modernize the brand. but I think it's unfortunate because in doing so, it loses a lot of its heritage. So the entire time we've been talking, I'm thinking, well, what's going to happen to the Ford Explorer they have parked there? What's going to happen to the Spinosaurus? I know it's still there at the moment. Is it going to stay there? But crucially, those clips of Richard Attenborough as John Hammond introducing this new park, they can't redo those, so they're going to be gone. And I think that's really, really sad, actually, because that's a lovely piece of heritage that Richard Attenborough has had for years that just has in many ways kept John Hammond alive for many fans. I'm actually Seriously, tearing up yeah. a little bit saying it, that. It is, it is tough to see stuff like that go because you think about, oh, the ride, blah, 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 whatever, the the theming and stuff. But yeah, the the legacy there that's there, um, you know, when you think back to that iconic image of like Jeff Goldblum, like lighting the park gates and, and you know, hearing the stories about Steven Spielberg wanting to be left off at the top of the ride and, and and all that behind the scenes material from the opening, like all that stuff's gonna be gone. It's like erased, and I'm sure they'll do the same. You'll have Chris Pratt out there, Bryce Dallas Howard lighting the park gates, and and all this. So it, there will be new stuff to look on. But as far as that iconic like John Hammond performance captured on the set of Jurassic Park, like that's that'll be all gone. Like so, that's a real shame. But um, hopefully it'll stay out in Orlando. That's potentially the the rumors right now that that will stay and they'll get a new Jurassic world land as well. So that that's the best thing that we can hope for. Um, But those are the rumors, at least for this year. Um, We also got the debut of blue, the Raptor, um, which is awesome. They used to have that old Raptor out there, the, the Brown one. Um, They got it in both those, the, the U S parks. I don't know if it's anywhere else. I forget, but um, that um, puppet, because there is somebody in there is, incredible it's really really lifelike really feels like you're meeting blue it's it's so awesome um so that was a great addition 
they also had it's really nice hearing you talk about that as well because you've had your photo with you fairly recently yeah so it's really nice because i can just hear in your voice how much that's like immersed you in blue as a character and actually getting to interact with her which is really really nice to hear yeah i mean the other raptor was fine and i thought that was great at the time but you know it actually it's looked really really goofy um, and that was that was understandable for that point. But um, once they released Blue, it's like, oh, my God, this thing is incredible. It looks real. And uh, I do prefer the Orlando version because it's hidden behind the grass and it kind of is obscured. So you don't really notice that there's a human standing in there. But when you go out to California, the thing roams around the, the park there and it it certainly looks like there's just a human standing in a suit. But um, <laughs> that's the unfortunate downside. So once that will probably be redone. Um, be redone they'll probably include a, a special meet and greet section i would assume um yeah but so that was in addition to both those parks there was also universal orlando's cinematic celebration which is a new water nighttime show on the lagoon there in, in uh, the orlando park um and that that's awesome because the the start of the show opens up with a little segment there but then it opens up into jurassic world and it has um, some bits from both World and Fallen Kingdom. So, you know, unfortunately, the I think it was, oh, man, what was the cinematic spectacle? Uh, spect- I don't remember what it was called. There was it, These names are very confusing, but there was like a nighttime show there that had Jurassic Park in it, and now that's gone, but now there's Jurassic World and Fallen Kingdom as well, and it's really awesome. It's a really great um, show based on like um, – water screens so they just shoot water really high up into the air and they project images and stuff on there they also project imagery on the background buildings and stuff like that um there's there's music there's sound effects there's all kinds of great stuff and you know the highlight i feel like is when uh the mosasaurus jumps out of the lagoon i think that's really awesome but yeah. there's that. There's also the Universal Spectacle Night Parade out in Japan. Which, oh, my um, God. That looked incredible. Yeah. Jack Humans was out there for it, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He recently went out to go check that out. Um, and it, it's awesome, man. I mean, they got the entire, um, like, gyrosphere going down the lane. They've got an entire uh, T-Rex um, little – It's not. it's not a full, like, animatronic, but it does move around a little bit here and there. And there's – Parasaur, Parasaur Olyphus, there's raptors, there's stuff like that just roaming around. It looks awesome. It looks like a lot of fun. There's projections on the buildings. Um, it's really cool. They got a ton of floats out there for Jurassic, so they're definitely treating it right. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I think that looked incredible, and that's something that I really hope does make its way over to Orlando and other places because I think it is just a really, really special thing to be able to like witness a live show that's constantly running at these attractions. I think that's something that a lot of characters like Mickey Mouse, where you get your meets and greets with him. Like I'm sure you probably did some of those with Lincoln while you were over there. Um, The fact that you get those kind of live interactions, I really think will benefit the other friends that are out there as well. Yeah, it definitely helps enhance the experience when you have your own interaction, something unique. So I think that's uh, that's what they're doing there. And it's, it's great. It's awesome that they're including this stuff. Wicked, right. Um, I kind of, I'm not sure what direction we want to go in now, really. What do you think, Brad? Uh, why don't we stick with events and stuff like that? Um, yeah, so yeah, that sounds good to me. We, we did touch on JP25 a little bit, um, so we don't really need to cover that again. Um, uh, we talked about fan interactions and, and uh, meeting each other and creating our own experiences. So a lot of us uh, got to meet up and go to... Uh, Fallen Kingdom, which was our own events, which I thought was really um, awesome. You yes. know, like so, I met up with with Jen and Chris Pugh, and we went to go see the movie. You met up with like so many dif- different people. I think Clayton and Stephen, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and I saw Raptor, Clayton Fioriti, yeah. Stephen. Um, it was just amazing. I I saw that film with so many different people. I saw it with Sonny, um, who is one of my good Jurassic Park friends in the country, and some of his friends. I saw it with. Um, Dan, Colette, some other people I've met through Twitter as well. So it was a really, really special experience because I got to like share that with so many different people and also see how loads of different people reacted to it as well, which yeah. was really, really fun. Another thing that you did too, you went and got to meet Sam Neill, right? Like at a, oh, at a, my God. a whatever it is, a right. Comic-Con? 
Yes, um, I paid £70 for <laughs> a photograph with Sam Neill, which was absolutely incredible. It was London Film and Comic Con, which is different to MCM, which we mentioned earlier. They're like the two big comic cons that happen in the UK every year. Um, and it is the first time Sam Neill has done the convention circuit in the UK for absolute years. I had no plans whatsoever to go up to London Comic Con because I generally like it a little bit less than MCM. Um, and then I think it was like a couple of weeks before they announced that Sam Neill was going. Um, I was um in and ah in about booking my tickets. Yeah, I think were. I messaged you guys a lot, didn't <laughs> I, asking? And I got like a mixed reaction. I yeah, you, you, I was like, it. dude, you got to do it. Like, don't miss that yeah. opportunity, even if it is a little expensive. And But when you look back, you're going to be like, oh, man, I missed out. I, I really should have yeah. went. That's the only thing you'll end up saying. You, you probably wouldn't say like, man, I'm glad I kept that money. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and actually, originally, I think I even said this to you guys. I was like, oh, I'm not going to go. It's just too expensive. Yeah. Um, but at the last minute, I changed my plans. So I was like, do you know what? I'm going to go up even if I just spend – like the seventy pound on the photo and twenty pound on the train. It's worth it to see Sam Neil. And it was just really special. It was really surreal. He's such like I don't know, an, an almost like gentle person. He was really laid back and calm, which was nice. And I always remember um when he walked over to the photo area, there was a massive crowd of people walking around and you just see Sam Neill casually walking through the convention with his security guards a few steps behind him, not even phased by like all the people around him or anything. It was really surreal seeing how like laid back and chill back he was. And it was just really special meeting Alan Grant, who is undoubtedly the face of that first film. Yeah, and I know um, Jay Jurassic got a chance to meet Jeff Goldblum, so it seems like yeah. the two of them were out on the circuit, which was really awesome. Um, Jeff Goldblum was like all over the place, um, so I know a lot of people got to meet him. And Jay actually did like a full um, segment on the podcast talking about his experience, and it was it was awesome. He's his his episodes are always like so nostalgic, and hearing him talk about the love of meeting you know Jeff Goldblum, it's it's exactly like you talking about meeting. Uh, you know, Sam Neill. So that's, that's awesome. And it, that's just like uh, some of the events, like these little things out there that we didn't realize were going to be popping up. It's like all of a sudden there's all these drastic experiences that you can do. Um, yeah. so also I didn't, you know, I didn't get to go to any of these, but Jurassic world, the exhibition hit Paris and Madrid this past year. Yeah. So that was, that so, was really awesome. Uh, and it was, it was on the silent front because they're not really our, uh, you know, areas of expertise when it comes to Paris and Spain and, and France and Spain and stuff like that. But it was huge for all these fans out there. <clears throat> I know Fede got to go and he met Jack Horner at the exhibition when it was in Paris, which was really, really cool. Cause um, I think for a short while, Jack was traveling around with it, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, but I remember it really surprised me cause I was going to head out to Paris to visit it but it just ended up working out like a little bit too expensive to get the Eurostar. So I assumed that the next natural progression, because it's just across the channel from us, would have been London. So I was expecting it to come to London. It was right around the time when um, Dinos in the Wild closed up, so there wasn't any live dinosaur experience, so it would have made sense. And then out of nowhere, it just went to Madrid, which I think shocked everyone. But which I think is, again, a really, really nice tribute to J.A. Bayona actually being a Spanish director. I think it was Madrid where they had the premiere for the European version of the premiere for Fallen Kingdom as well. So um, it's a really nice homage that actually it gets to go out to his kind of hometown and people who are proud of him for his directing in the film get to now go and experience it live as well. Yeah, um, there there is... Um a lot of updates. I forget one, or there was a lot of updates on um, this past year as far as um, the exhibition is concerned. I know the company city neon who runs it all um, there. They were opening. Uh, what? Let me see if I can find my notes here. Um, they are constructing like another set, I believe maybe, yeah. maybe more. Um, I think they, they said they're doing two in total. So there'll be three yeah, going around. Eventually. I think so. Yeah. So it's eventually going to hit Las Vegas um in time for Jurassic World 3 so that's going to be that's going to be a while um yeah. and let's see yeah so yeah it said um 
North America, uh, North Asia. I'm sorry. So it's going to hit um, North Asia after Madrid. That's what it. That's where it should be going next, as long as it goes to, you know, according to plan. Uh, they're designing and building the. Ooh, what is it three and four? So um, after the construction of the second one, so there's there should be four in total. Um, that's crazy. But See, I don't know. That makes me question. I genuinely believe if these new lands are happening, if we do get new space in Orlando, it would make all too much sense to have one exhibition be a permanently static feature at one of them. That would that be would awesome. That would just seem yeah. so logical. Yeah. That would be really cool. Um, maybe, maybe eventually that would be something that they could do. Just like a nice little walkthrough experience. It would be great yeah. because Universal is keen on doing walkthrough experiences. They have Walking Dead. Um, they've done, um, you know, Halloween Horror Nights and stuff like that. So those are all walkthrough attractions. Recently, they tested keeping um, Stranger Things open after um halloween horror nights so there was like rumors that maybe that'll make its own appearance as its own attraction so something like that would be very cool and it would just be a continual flow of people moving through you wouldn't be able to um spend as much time as as like say the super fans did that we did back in the day when it was like two hours we spent in a 30 minute attraction like so (laughs) But it would be continuously moving. You could revisit it time and time again. But um, that would be awesome if that was the case. I ho- I definitely hope that that's what happens. Like, I hope it comes to the UK eventually because obviously I'm a UK fan. But I think beyond these things traveling around, they need to find a permanent home. Because I think, like, um, so something Chris pointed out on the most recent episode of the In General podcast is that there's still a Shrek attraction in London. If there's still a Shrek attraction in London years after that franchise hasn't really had any growth or any input, then why can there not be static Jurassic attractions somewhere? You know, even if it's not Jurassic related, dinosaurs as a whole are always going to have interest in, um, from different people, from paleontologists, from children. So it would make sense for them to have a static exhibition. Somewhere. Well, you, you want to hear? You want to hear how bad this is? Universal um, currently has a Shrek attraction. And it's um, a static attraction. It doesn't move or any aside from the seating. The seating kind of just bounces <laughs> and stuff like that. But it's a it's a standard like movie theater with a screen and the seats kind of vibrate or move or whatever. Um, and there's some other effects and stuff in there. And that's been there for a whole lot of years now. And it is apparently well received amongst park goers, um, uh, uh, according to theme park like fans and stuff like that. It's a yeah. garbage attraction. It's very bad. Um, and the crazy thing is the attraction, the video is, is included on the Shrek DVD. Apparently it's on Netflix. So you can (laughs) see it online or on a DVD and it still gets high ratings as far as a a park attraction goes. So it means nothing, like none of this means anything. Like you could have a Jurassic attraction there for years and years and years, have it on DVD, have it everywhere and people would still go. So, you know, you just got to have some faith, I think. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think, you know, ultimately these things do have the potential to be static. I think that, um, say for example, when I went to Dinosaurs in the Wild, that did a really, really good run. It was a static uh, attraction that stayed in place in London for several months. And it was really, really popular. And I think that now that that's closed, people are crying out for something else that is more permanent. So I think there's definitely scope for something. Yeah. Um, so we also got announced early in the year Jurassic World Live. So all these names are very, very confusing because I was like, yeah. I was coming up with this list. I'm like, Jurassic World Alive? Jur- I know there's another one that's very <laughs> similar. I'm like, oh, just drop the A. There it is. Jurassic <laughs> World Live. Um, um, <clears throat> which I did actually, I wanted to ask you about this one because you've put on our list that it was almost canceled and I never heard about that. So I was interested in what happened there. Shh, be very quiet. Be very quiet. It was almost canceled. Like, so, yeah. Um, this is not something that's really out there. Um, but so Jurassic World Alive was announced. Um, it's going to be a uh, an arena show. So, yeah, like Walking with Dinosaurs or something like that. Um, and... Yeah, so you get to sit in the arena. There's going to be potentially like gyrosphere VIP seatings on the ground, um, a dinosaur show on the on the ground there. And um, so the company that that runs it apparently ran into some snags earlier in the year 
with licensing, um, as far as I'm as far as I've known, I've heard, um, and it was almost canceled. They almost said we can't do it. We're gonna have to rebrand to a new general general specific like nothing nothing like touching on Jurassic, but just a general dinosaur show, just like Walking with Dinosaurs or something like that. Yeah. So that was the word for a very long time, and then I you know I heard that it was back on. So luckily they got the licensing figured out apparently and now it's back on track. So it seems to be back on track. Everything seems to be okay. Um, Hopefully that sticks. Um, Hopefully I'm I'm not lying to you here, but that seems to be, (laughs) that seems to be the the word right now that it's back on track for, I think it was fall 2019. So we should be hopefully hearing some more in the coming year. Um, But that, that is exciting because I was, I was a little upset because once you turn it into just the standard dinosaur thing, I mean, I'm still excited. I, th- I still think it would be fun to go to, but I definitely lost interest as far as that's concerned. Um, because if it has Jurassic attached to it, I'm, you know, tons more apt to go to it, <laughs> to go to that yeah. and to, to experience it and to cover it. Once it just becomes a standard dinosaur one, I'm like, okay, well that seems fun, but I don't know, maybe I'll skip it. But, um, but now it seems to be back on track, so that is a good thing. <clears throat> I think there's definitely scope for things like this as well. Like I'm using that phrase a lot, that there's room for scope. But there is, because walking with dinosaurs, as you guys know, I did an episode on that and I wrote an article on it. I went and saw that and it was incredible. And there were so many, like the one thing I remember is so many kids in there shouting out the names of dinosaurs that it just highlighted to me so much at like kids at the moment are really connecting with dinosaurs and there's really this appetite not just in adult fans but in yeah. younger people for more things to do with dinosaurs yeah so let's move on to um some some other new stuff um we have other like other types of media out there that have been released over the past year yeah um i i almost mentioned this one earlier but uh, there's a jurassic world blue vr game or experience i guess you could say um yeah. it's by felix and paul and that thing was really awesome it was like a nice tie-in sort of like a little prequel to jurassic world fallen kingdom where you kind of follow blue along before the the volcano kind of goes crazy and stuff like that like leading basically right up to the movie um and that was that was awesome it was very um planet earth like which i thought was very cool we've heard colin recently talk about that with the outpost interview about you know watching along with planet earth and maybe creating something along those lines and and i think this jurassic world blue vr thing was along those lines it was very planet earthy um so you're basically it was just like a camera it was like you basically following along with blue experiencing these little interactions with other other dinosaurs and stuff like that so i thought that was really cool um I didn't. I did not get to experience it aside from watching it on YouTube. You got to check that out, right? Yes, I did get to check it out. It was at MCM, so we're back talking about MCM again. Um, <laughs> one of Universal's biggest highlights there was indeed the Blue VR experience. I think we queued up for about thirty minutes to try it, and it's only well when we were there, it was only the first part that had been released. So we literally queued up for about two minutes of actual VR time. Yeah. But it was really, really cool. Just kind of basically being immersed with a few different dinosaurs around and then seeing Mount Saibo erupt. Yeah. That's really awesome. I, I, uh, I love that they're, they're doing stuff like this. Like, you know, we've talked about so much stuff already and the fact that there is still so much more out there that, that we're discussing is incredible for us fans, you know? Uh, one of the biggest things this past year was of the evolution of Claire, which was yes. a huge step for us as fans. You know, getting a, a brand new novel set in the film canon, um, a prequel. Um, I thought it was fantastic. I really, really loved that book. Um, Tess Sharp did an amazing job, uh, you know, creating that world, creating uh, the younger life of Claire and uh, building Jurassic World as a theme park up from the ground. Like, it was awesome. I thought it was, she did a great job, you know, with that book. I think it's one of the best additions to the canon in years, to be honest. Because yeah. I think it, um, well, I say in years, there's not really been much to compare it to beyond the films. Um, but <laughs> I think that it just did a really good job of building up the park as a real and lived environment, with real people like working in it. So, Obviously, on screen, you only see Claire, Owen, 
very specific roles that the film wants to tailor you to kind of focus on. You know, you get the exciting job, the raptor trainer. Um, but in this novel, you really see all kinds of different people working to keep this park functioning on a day-to-day basis as it's yeah. being built. And you really learn a lot more about the infrastructure of the island, uh, some of the issues that they faced, some of the attractions that we don't see in the film or on the map, like the botanical gardens, which is really, really cool. Um, and all about these like other areas of Nublar that were being worked on that really don't get touched on at all, yeah. um, which I thought was really, really cool. It was a really, really good piece of world building canon, I think, that actually really helped to add a lot of life to Jurassic World as a real lived-in attraction. Um, And I think it's important to highlight that the Jurassic World website already did that very, very well. So the Evolution of Claire really just took that a step further to make it feel like a real environment. Yeah, and another thing we didn't really touch on actually was the the updates to the Jurassic World website. You know, the the official park map and stuff like that that made you feel like you were visiting a real-life Jurassic World was taken over by the dpg and everything was closed and and uh dangerous and all that stuff so that was that was fun to see that kind of interaction and um i think like the the storyline continued you, you talked about like building a world and stuff like that they with like the vr thing it feels real the evolution of claire claire feels real like you're these lived in environments and then you had jurassic world revealed which was like another random pop-up from from uh man I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the studio um at the moment um, but um it was an alexa and in- like for any alexa enabled device uh your amazon echoes stuff like that um there was jurassic world revealed which you would say like alexa open jurassic world revealed and she would go through a uh, choose your own adventure for jurassic world via a podcaster janet best who yeah. traversed out to the island to track down a story which it was just like crazy to hear like podcaster Janet Best going out. To, you're like, wait, what? Like, there's a podcaster going out. What's what's happening here? Should have been Brad Jones. Oh I no! Mean, <laughs> but like, I just I just thought that was like a hilarious inclusion. Like, that's the story that they went with. I thought that was yeah incredible. Um, so that was really cool. Um, then continuing with Choose Your Own Adventures, the Lego series had one on YouTube, which was a really cool, like, innovative little thing. I thought where you could. Like on the end screens, you could choose your own route, which way you wanted to go with the story. I thought that was really cool. It was like a little story about like getting blue somewhere or something like that, I think. Yeah. It basically just kind of told the stories of the Lego sets and was kind of like little pieces of advertisement for them. Yeah, it was um, cute little things, nothing too special, but. It really fitted with like the quirky Lego tone. Mm-hmm. Um, which was really nice to see. And it's just, you know, it's something extra that's out there getting people talking about it. Yeah. And even currently, it's still continuing with Lego. They have the secret exhibit, um, which oh, was yes. two, like two 24 minute, like little um, TV shows, essentially. And I, you know, I hesitate to say TV shows because everybody's getting amped up about TV shows right now when it comes to Jurassic World and, and the Lego brand. Uh, but we, you know, we, we thought that last time. So, I think they're taking yeah. things a little bit more seriously this time around. You know, the Indominus Escape was also a 24-minute little, uh, you know, movie or TV show. And we we debated that with the director, uh, Michael D. Black, back on one of our episodes when that released. And we're like, hey, is this going to lead to anything more? He's like, I don't know. You're going to have to keep your eyes peeled. And nothing ever came from it. So, yeah. I would hope that maybe they're taking a little bit more chance because instead of just being released on YouTube or Netflix or wherever, um, they actually took the time to put this on NBC on a prime time uh, spot, I think on a Sunday night maybe. So yeah, that's a big deal having it like 8 p.m. Um, on a Sunday. Like that's that's a big deal having a Jurassic branded thing for kids like that's that's taking a chance hopefully i don't know what the ratings were really but um hopefully it paid off um but i don't know if we'll see any more or not yeah no i'm not sure i think it really i'm i hope we do and i think this time it left it on a much bigger cliffhanger than it did. Um, i guess the last I, time did i think it the last one definitely left it on a cliffhanger as well it's been years now so you know at the end of that one they basically like they're like, oh well, the the Indominus is is no longer the threat, but we do have the uh, ext- what was the uh, name of that toy um, from Hasbro? Oh. 
You remember it was um it was the red and white Indominus with the spikes on the back. That oh, was it what was they... the hybrid Indominus. I can't remember. Yeah, the actual I name. forget. Yeah. I forget what the name was, but they they kind of incorporated that Hasbro toy into a Lego toy. It was very interesting. So they never went just anywhere Googling with that. It, actually, to find out what. Yeah, it was. you might as well. It was, but that was like essentially the secret exhibit at that time. It was like, ooh, who has something else cooking up? back there and um nothing ever came from it they definitely set it up it was like a little cliffhanger and nothing ever happened so this time around the cliffhangers is the cliffhanger is there and it's it's definitely more impactful i think it could be more impactful and i don't know if it will ever pan out in canon but um it would be interesting though i think one thing to touch on and we'll talk about merchandise a little bit later um, is the fact that there is more Lego coming in 2019. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get into all that, I'm there sure. There wasn't this... anything else released after the 2015 line, but in theory, okay. a show could be propped up by the fact that there are more releases planned for 2019 this time around. Yeah, they yeah, it's very true. They continue a Lego show. Very true, yeah. There's definitely more material to support it this time. Um, we also had, I did not check this one out, but a Simpsons Treehouse <laughs> of Horror. <laughs> Uh, this, yeah, the Simpsons do the Treehouse of Horror like every year, I guess, and uh, it's their Halloween themed episode. And this time it was like partially branded to Jurassic World, so that that was funny. But there's been so many, so many other material. SNL like leading up to Jurassic World, Saturday Night Live had so many Jurassic themed sketches, and that's an NBC show which is owned by Comcast, which is a Universal. Like, so it's all the same. So of course they're going to promote the movie as much as possible. Um, we had American Ninja Warrior, which is also on NBC, which had a uh, Jurassic themed show. And um, aside from that, there was just tons of uh, Gold Bloom Jeep commercials, which is fantastic. Must go faster. Yeah, that was around the um, <laughs> Super Bowl release. That was like one of those. It nice was surprises. right when the trailer came out because everyone thought that Jeff was going to be back on Nubla. Yeah, it was like it was like this interesting little thing. We're like, whoa, what does this mean? This is awesome because he's getting chased by a T Rex and he's in the Jeep and uh, it was it was really cool. But um, and then it cuts to a showroom. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, as far as um, all that's concerned, there's probably more that we're missing, but uh, those were the, some of the highlights right there. Um, we also had a ton of merchandise. Um, now yes. there's been. I'm not going to go through all this stuff because. There's been immeasurable amounts of material from Chronicle, uh, Iron Studios, and Prime One, which are the like the big three, I guess. Even though Chronicle is like trying to like take control of all two, uh, all the other two, and just have them under their banner here in the U.S. Think, so yeah, very much so. Like Chronicle's been dominating a lot of what the other two have done, and I think without um, being new neg- too negative. It's unfortunate because I think the other two's work definitely outweighs Chronicles in some aspects. Agreed. Yeah, definitely agreed there. But I, I'm very excited. There's been some really fun pieces. Um, you know, I recently, I forget, I think it was Iron Studios showing off like that Brachiosaurus with the trees. Yes. And you got you got uh, Grant, Ellie, and, and Hammond. That thing is insane. It will be super overpriced, but um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just like, oh my god, that would be amazing. So that's just like some of the stuff. But like, then you have Smart Arts Gallery, which produced a lot of really cool artwork and and stuff from their stores. So they had all this stuff released, um, jewelry, b- uh, bottle openers, all kinds Limited of cool edition stuff. Limited coins, coins, which have been really, yeah. really cool. We've taken a look at some of them on the podcast as yeah. well. Yeah, they've had a lot of really good stuff. Um, a company called Han Cholo released a lot of jewelry as well. Drop Dead released some really inspired like clothing pieces and stuff like that. Um, I, I think they made like the yellow rain jacket and stuff like that, right? Um, there was some interesting stuff. But one of the things that never really came to fruition so far um, was a Mondo board game. Um, that one was called The Chaos yeah. Gene. So apparently like this has been rumored for a very long time they've showed a lot of specs and stuff and images from the board game itself but nothing ever came from it it just kind of was like lost it said that it was going to be released fall of this year but um i don't know not out there so (laughs) hopefully it's it's still coming um 
Which, yeah, I, I, think I mean, yeah, Mondo hopefully. is quite a reputable company, aren't they? So. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, who knows what with licensing issues and stuff like that, but it seemed like they were on track, but I have not heard a single thing. But then again, we've had Jurassic World board games in other countries, um, and then the uh, Jurassic Park Danger, which has been available here in like Target and stuff like that. So there, there has been no shortage of board games when it comes to Jurassic franchise. Um, also, the Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom novelization, which was really, really interesting. I have not covered that in detail like I've wanted to yet, but there's a lot of really cool um, tidbits in there. I'm not going to touch on them here, but there's there's a ton of stuff in there that's different from the movies um, mm. that's just worth reading. Um, but f- as far as reading material concern is concerned, outside of like the evolution of Claire and the novelization, there's so many like little kid things like sticker books and Lego novels and, 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 uh, how to, I recommend survival guides, guide survival yeah. for Lego novels. That is such so a good book. Cause it's very kid orientated, but it gives you a nice look at a lot of the, um, dinosaur models that were made specifically for the Indominus Rex breakout, which is really cool. Yeah. I I've been loving like just you know, happening upon these books on a shelf and you never know what you're going to find out there. There's been a lot of really cool, like, um, um, I don't know, film tied in books where you get to see new imagery, different, um, different angles and stuff behind the scenes, photos and stuff. So really keep your eyes out because there's some really unique stuff out there, like on the shelves for kids. So it's, it's awesome. So we also have, let's see, oh, the trading cards as well are sort of in that genre where you get to see new imagery, angles and things that you've never seen before, um, cool, really cool, like trading unique cards and stuff like that. So just keep your eyes out. The trading cards are kind of like impossible to find on the <laughs> on the market now, aside from like the, the like Ebays and stuff like that. But um, it's hard to find them nowadays, but um, they also made the dog dog tags and stuff, bullseye toys. Um, so yeah, there, there's been so much merch out there. I'm not even scratching the surface when it comes to everything that's been out there, but <laughs> it's, it's impossible to keep up these days. Yeah. Yeah, it's for sure. And that's like, like you say, we're not even scratching the surface because when it comes to toys, especially we have a whole separate subsection of just incredible toys that have been released this year. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Do your magic. Let's talk about the toys. Oh, my God. Right. So, firstly, we have to touch on Mattel. Um, Mattel, um, despite, I think, some grievances with their products not being available universally in different countries, they have absolutely nailed this license. Every single dinosaur they produce, if it's based on a Jurassic Park dinosaur or a Jurassic World dinosaur, so far they've been spot on to what we see on screen. Um, The Tyrannosaurus has got a beautiful mold. The Triceratops looks fantastic. The Baryonyx is incredible. Everything has really just been meticulously crafted with love. Um, yeah. We've got human characters for the first time in a Jurassic World line since the Kenner products. We finally have got humans as well. So we've got Owen, Claire, Maisie, Mercenaries, Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, Muldoon, Ian Malcolm. Loads of human characters to go alongside the dinosaurs as well. And then we've got incredible play sets. We've got vehicles. We've got um, smaller scale things. We've got products for kids. There's just everything out there that I think is being overwhelming, but overwhelming oh, yeah. in a very, very positive manner. That is the key word, overwhelming. There has been so much merchandise out there from Mattel um, and Matchbox as well because they're creating like the bigger vehicles and, and, and the smaller cars as well. But um, it's been just overwhelming. And the fact that it's not stopping – is is very interesting you know now we're getting the dino rivals and stuff like that and the spring line and is going to be out outrageous as well it's never going to stop i'm super excited to see what they're creating from here on out we should know pretty soon i know i know i I can't (laughs) wait to see that thing i know people are getting worried people are worried like where is it i you know they teased it so long ago i'm afraid they canceled it but I mean, it's, you know, we'll find out. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there on the horizon for 2019. Um, I hope they just don't overdo it, you know? I, I don't think yeah. so because we're crazy fans. We want all these pieces, but I just don't want them to overdo it. Right now, I'm feeling a little fatigue. Um, I haven't really seen anything new, to be honest, in the stores. I know a lot of people are seeing the Dino Rivals at this point. Um, I have one of them, actually, on my desk right now. Um, I got it from Amazon, but... um. 
it's I just don't want it to become too tiresome and too hard on the wallet because, you know, you're constantly bringing home these new toys. And uh, I just I'm, I'm just excited that they're there in general um, to be able yeah. to go go to the store and just even if you don't buy anything just to see them on the shelf. It's amazing to have something there to experience and, and to show like my kid and just to to have fun with. I think it's awesome that kids out there today get the chance to experience these toys. Um, you know, it, there, there's some faults in the toys and, and with the release of some toys, um, yeah, I'm not, you know, Spino obviously, but, um, <laughs> and some, some like some issues with stances and, and, um, durability and some paint job issues. But outside of that, it's been truly phenomenal. And Mattel has done an amazing, amazing job. Um, bringing this all to life, I, I can't really wait to see what 2019 brings. But I agree. Um, yeah, I think it's worth um, highlighting quickly as well the amazing work that Brit over at Mattel has done. Brit yes, Shop, the yes. brand manager, because I think that that is the most I have ever seen a brand manager actually interact with a community. Yeah, when we talked about Frontier and and stuff that Universal isn't doing, but Frontier is, Brit and and Mattel have been doing the same thing as Frontier. They've been taking charge and really interacting, becoming community members in their own right. And um, I think they've done a wonderful job at keeping in touch and learning what they need to do to make things better. You know, learning what the fans want to see and not just creating something like, like Hasbro did, you know, not paying attention to what the fans want. And, um, you know, when we released, uh, the, the, like our, I don't know what it was, I guess our wish list of, of stuff in a video back when that was, when was that even announced? I don't remember. That was a long time ago that we had heard that, um, Mattel was taking over and we did that video where we said like, we want to see this, 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 we had a lot of community members, people from just, just random people out there submitted videos and um, I think they really took that to heart. You know, we, we're not the yeah. only ones. There's Matt Brando out there. There's Victoria from Victoria's Cantina. So many people out there like saying what we wanted to see. And they really brought it to life. Yeah, they absolutely nailed it. And it's been incredible. Yeah. And um, even even Barbie released some stuff. <laughs> they had they had while well, they had a unique Owen with a wildly you know, um, inaccurate hairdo. Um, we also did get an awesome Claire. <laughs> so the Claire, Claire <laughs> yeah. looked fantastic. The Owen was a little iffy, but, um, I, I was so happy to see that they're releasing stuff like that as well. I thought that was phenomenal. It's definitely got a lot more brand presence in terms of toy brands than it's ever had before. Yeah. Imagine next, which is it's under the, the Mattel kind of brand there. Imagine next released a lot of really cool stuff for kids um funko has been phenomenal this year with their products i mean yep they've released so much stuff and it's hard to keep up they actually finally released the ellie um with the jeep um i need to despite, pick that one up actually. yeah i have not gotten it either but um despite the the issues with that figure and and stuff like that you know there's a whole lot of stuff going on there but it finally did get released um and some of your favorite stuff lego man go ahead Talk about that oh, for a minute. Oh, bro. So <laughs> I feel like I got a little bit too excited about Lego then. But um, <laughs> Lego has just been – it's been a hit or miss this year. It's definitely been a few sets like Lockwood Manor that are perhaps a little bit too shallow. But there's been a lot of really, really cool new dinosaur molds like the Carnotaurus, the Stiggy Moloch, um, the Indoraptor. We finally got a Jurassic Park set, which is incredible, with an original Velociraptor. Um, we got a retail exclusive set that came with a Dilophosaurus that looks exactly like the one from the original film. And it's not stopping there. Lego's continuing in 2019. And as far as we're aware, there's going to be two brand new sets coming. Uh, we've got absolutely no idea what they'll be to do with. But there is also supposedly a direct-to-consumer set coming, 
which is going to be over £200. So it's one of their big direct-to-consumer sets, which Lego do for a lot of brands. And a lot of the general consensus is that this could finally be a big Jurassic Park set that fans have been wanting to see for years. It could, of course, be Jurassic World, but if it is a Jurassic Park-branded direct-to-consumer set, I think it's going to be one of the best pieces of merchandise we will see in 2019. So I'm really, really excited to see how Lego continue the license. Um, And I think the nice thing with Lego as well is you can actually continue building things and making new things using your own ideas and designs. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I have not personally been very excited by that. There's their offerings. Like you had said, some of them are a little shallow. Some of them are not super in depth. I think like the stuff that they're including is nice, but they definitely need more. Like I, I'm blown yeah. away by the Star Wars stuff that's out there for Lego. Like the interaction with the toy and how massive some of them are. How how detailed. I've been let down as far as Jurassic is concerned with the price point. It's like it's a little too expensive. Yeah, but I um, I, I'm excited, like you were saying, like the, of what's to come. I think there could be some great great stuff. I think it's worth me highlighting as well that this year I actually had the opportunity to do all of the Lego reviews for Jurassic Collectibles, who's a good friend of us here at the podcast and always like shares everything we do. Um, and it was really special for me because I actually, um, well, David, who is the owner over at Jurassic Collectibles, was kind enough to buy them all for me to review for his channel. So it was really special for me because it was like my first experience of actually someone having that much faith in my content that they bought me everything to review. Um, which and I know that's like a really weird way of putting it, but it was just really nice that um, somebody had that much confidence in me to actually like just send me the stuff and say, hey, go ahead and review it. Um, and I think yeah, that's, that's something awesome. that definitely everything we do here on the podcast has really helped me build up to, which was really special. So that's kind of why I've got a lot of love for the Lego line. Um, yeah, I skimmed and, over it, but I think I don't know if it was this year or not. Was that th- this year that you went out to go visit uh, Funko Europe? Yeah, man. So that was wicked as well. <laughs> um, you can again tell by that really, really British reaction. Um, <laughs> I can't even get my words out. That's how excited I am. Basically, long story short, I've become awesome friends with um, the lady, Charlotte, who does all of Funko Europe social media. Got to go and visit them, do a podcast with them, talk about Jurassic Park. And it was just a really fun event. So it's been a great year for me because all of these toys and bits of merchandise have really encouraged a lot of creativity and a lot of content creation. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah. The, um, power wheels, um, released a Jeep, which was phenomenal. I think, um, <laughs> yes, I, I have not gotten it yet. I see it on the horizon, hopefully sometime soon, um, <laughs> with Lincoln. But, um, for years I was like, I'm going to just have to recreate one. I'm going to have to buy a Jeep. I'm going to have to repaint it, which I'm not good at any of that stuff. <laughs> but, um, finally, like it's like 200 something bucks, I think, which is, yeah, it's, it's expensive, but, um, I think it'll be worth it. That thing looks awesome. Oh, and uh, something from Mattel that we didn't announce that um, or touch on that Alpha Training Raptor, which was yes. that like little like uh, r- robotic Raptor Blue, which was incredible. Like that thing is also like the two hundred dollar thing sparked my memory because it's very expensive, <laughs> but it looks really awesome. And that's like somewhere I did not expect them to go. It's like a blue you can actually train and interact with, yes. which is really cool. So awesome. Um, and, uh, as far as like uh, other stuff is concerned, we had a lot of plushies. So there was like yeah. so much stuff on the shelves, literally like when this stuff was released, it was put out on the shelves a week later, it's all gone. Like everything <laughs> yeah. is gone. Like I, I only got one Stiggy and that was it. And that's all we have. <laughs> and they've never been found since. <laughs> so there's that. There's also, um, for black Friday this year, there was like a giant blue. That thing was huge. Yeah. Um, it was like the the msrp was like 50 bucks and then they knocked it down to like 25 for like black friday but i haven't seen it since um there's also been tons of pillows and stuff like that released like a giant footprint there's all kinds of stuff um Massive oh, I, volcano I, you've got yeah you? I, i've got the lego uh the lego what did i just say that for <laughs> looking at the notes the volcano one um so yeah there's been so much stuff there's like coin banks there's uh lights for kids rooms there's comforter sets sheets like anything you could want for like kids it's out there and i can't believe 
all this stuff is on the shelves. It's it's really awesome. And and the clothing too. I didn't uh I know we touched on some of the other companies out there that are making stuff, but like just in Targets, Walmarts, any store out there, I think like Box Lunch, um Hot Topic, all these places, Pack Sun, they're all releasing like Jurassic clothes and it's it's fantastic to see this stuff out there. Um yeah. and I just constantly see it all the time now. And I I love like the onesies for kids that are like maybe for like 10 year olds or something like that, that are like a full blue onesie. Like it's yeah. awesome. Like where's the adult one? Give me that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, man, I think it's, it's been outrageous. It's definitely just in general, 2018 has been a special year. Cause I think Jurassic has kind of commanded store shelves and aisles more than it ever has before. So whereas in 2015 the releases, we got really Hasbro Lego and not much else. This year, it's been everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there, there's been. I mean, we can just touch on this thing quickly here. Yeah. A few news items. Um, over the year, you know, we we of course learned that Colin Trevorrow is directing Jurassic World three. Emily Carmichael, writer, who is joining uh, Colin Trevorrow to write Jurassic World three, and we've seen some awesome interaction from her as well. So she's kind of following Colin's she's footsteps. She's amazing. Oh yeah, she she's is like. I, I don't know why, but whenever I tweet her, she always takes the time to get back to me. Yeah, and like I phenomenal. say, I don't know why, because I tweet her the most meaningless stuff. <laughs> but <laughs> she's she's just awesome. She, you can tell she's absolutely loving being involved in this community and interacting with people. And I, I have a lot of love for Emily. I think she's going to be an awesome addition to the people who are working on these films and making them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really excited because Colin has a lot of faith in her. Um, most recently she did Pacific Rim Uprising, which ne- never really got glowing reviews or anything like that. But, um, I don't know if that was fully her, her gig or not. Um, I forget. Yeah. Um, but also John Schwartzman was, re- was announced, I guess, as a cinematographer, Jurassic World three. I think he worked with Colin, um, back, uh, on Jurassic World. So I don't think that's yeah, much of a surprise. Did. But, no. um, also Jurassic Park was just recently added to the National Film Registry because, it's iconic. Let's face it; it deserves to be preserved and and recognized for its uh, standard in the industry and uh, history when it comes to film and and everything. So I think it's well deserved to be recognized yeah. in that sense. I agree a hundred percent. I think because we're starting to get into quite a long episode now. Yeah. Maybe the last few points we've got we should just touch on quite briefly. So. If we go over the community bits, ahead, if you're yeah. happy for me to like start yeah, just, talking just go ahead, about yeah. that. You're yep, good. Wicked. You got it. So um, firstly, we had JW Exodus, which was an awesome film produced by Gregory Wong um, and a few other individuals. It included the absolutely awesome actor Jamie Costa, who's known for his really cool Han oh, Solo yes. impression. <laughs> um, yeah, He's awesome. I'm sure... Yeah, like being the massive Star Wars fan you are, Brad, I knew you would love him being in that. His um, impressions are phenomenal, yeah. Yeah, they are really good. We've done some cool content on that, so if you want to like learn more about it, go see the film, everything. Do a search for Jurassic World Exodus on our website, and you'll be able to find loads of fun stuff, including interviews and other things. Um, furthermore, in the community, we had Journey Back to the Island, which was a Jurassic Park 25th music celebration that I was really lucky to get involved in with chiefly Caleb Burnett and Daryl Lee Lynn, but there were some other people involved as well. Um, And it was a really fun kind of thing where several different composers came together to give their own renditions of music that would be Jurassic in tone and score. Um, And they recreated some iconic scenes, but with different scores, which was really, really cool. Yeah, that was awesome. And I got to help with some of the artwork for that, which was fun. I thought that was really special because it it created a vibe that you could tell, like, they put their all into this music. And and I really, really loved all the work that everybody put into that. It was it was you know, emotional. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, then Extinction Level Jurassic Park ended. So Arjun's big radio play that he created exclusively for the Jurassic Park podcast, a lot of us got involved in it. You had community members like Jack De La Mer, um, and Jack, oh my God, I nearly said his name wrong. I nearly said Jack's middle name as his first name, but Jack <laughs> um, Oh boy. Um, and Brad, you were involved in it. I was oh, involved I think- in it. 
I think you could just say everybody was involved in it. It was yeah, basically it was a, everyone like a community wide effort. Um, it was it was incredible. Like I was really sad to see it go. But um, yeah. I know I know he has more stuff on the horizon. So definitely keep your ears peeled for uh, 2019. And guys, if you love hearing the beautiful British tones of a 19-year-old <laughs> based in Kent who doesn't podcast as much as he should, with no beard, then you can look forward to hey, um, <laughs> you can look forward to hearing more of these luscious vocal cords in some potential future projects that Arjun's working on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then lastly, we were just going to touch on Neems, who is one person in the community who's done some awesome posters. Um, one of which actually ended up being officially published and he worked alongside Universal to get it out there for the film. And um, he really just encompasses a wave of creative individuals that have come to the forefront since Fallen Kingdom came out and beforehand. Um, I know yeah. we're always working on content. There's Victoria's Cantina, Jurassic Collectibles, Everything Jurassic Park, who's working on creative content for Minecraft. You've got... Um, Michael Pierce, who is continuing to support um, Jurassic Explorer alongside loads of other people. You've got yeah. Jack Ewins, who is now working on Dino Defenders Extreme, um, and loads of other creative individuals who really are kind of they're working on stuff. So Neems is just really the tip of the iceberg of a ton of really awesome people who have been making content. Yeah, it's been awesome. I know Ted Brothers has been like blowing it out of the water with – um, his artwork, oh, his repaints and, as well. They're incredible. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Victoria with a lot of her photography, her podcasts and everything that's out there. Uh, Travis Stevens has been do doing a lot of like kit bashing and paint jobs and all, all kinds of awesome stuff out there. I love everything that he does. Um, it's impossible. I can't, I can possibly, it's just like, I feel like it's like the Oscars when like you win an award <laughs> and you're trying to remember everybody out there and you forget everybody. That's what yeah. it feels like. So I know, I know everybody out there is doing. Oh, you know, James and Steve are doing it. Sorry, guys, forgot you guys. You're doing so much great stuff on your YouTube channel, whether it's the game uh, yes. reviews or the, um, the the run throughs of Jurassic World Evolution or the Minecraft stuff. So much great stuff going on out there. Um, but yeah, everybody, everybody is doing some great work. It's it's incredible. I think this franchise produced a lot of really creative people. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. And everyone's got their specialisms. Everyone's working really hard to make content that other people enjoy and interact with. And it just feels like a really inclusive community filled with people who are complementary of what each other does, who build up one another, and who really, really encourage talent to thrive, which is really, really nice to see. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the best part. We're, we're fairly non-toxic <laughs> when it comes yeah. to fan communities. Yeah. So um, that, that's a good thing. I think on the topic of talent thriving, since obviously this is primarily your dream, Brad, you've started everything um, with the podcast here. Would you like to handle the next section to highlight sure, sure. some of the key points from this year? Yeah, I think I think it's been a very awesome year for the podcast. You know, we've had a ton of episodes, like almost in the middle of the year, it was like, double episode like two episodes every week maybe more it really depended on the week we we went all out when it comes to fallen kingdom and and all the games and, and toys and everything there were so many bonus episodes but i just wanted to highlight a few of our unique standout things um yeah. you know james and steve uh did their jurassic pop quiz with the gaming beaver that was really fun um we've also done a ton of other jurassic pop quiz so not to fault any of the others but just to stand out there um one of my favorite ones was actually with ted brothers we actually did a top five like jurassic memories which i thought was yeah. really unique because um it wasn't something that really just encapsulated the movies themselves but just our own feelings and memories from the past and things that really stood out to us i thought that was really unique way to look at it and ted was totally on board with that we did a awesome episode um back when the jp25 event went down <coughs> excuse me um we did not get to go out there but a lot of people did and we got a lot of feedback and and uh voice recordings and stuff like that from the parks so uh there's an awesome episode on that out there 
Um, I know you and James and Steve actually did a ton of work at um, Frontier. You know, you kind of hinted that was, at that before. Yeah. So you guys did like um, ep- like several episodes and videos and all kinds of content with like Johnny Watts, uh, Michael Brooks, Bo, who's hugely influential out there. Um, I do just want to jump in and say Bo is one of the people in the community team at Frontier who I have tons of love for because I'm like the most annoying person ever. (laughs) I always message her with really ridiculous ideas and things and she always comes back to me no matter what. So, Bo, you're probably not listening to this, but if you are, we all have a lot of love for you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think you guys did a great job. You know, you, James and Steve did some awesome work out there covering that. Um, So those are certainly some highlights. Um, I also did speak with Silas Lesnick of Movie Bill and they produced like um, something we didn't even talk about, but like a nice little booklet, kind of like a playbill that you get at the movie theater when you went to go see Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. So that was really cool. I also spoke with Tess Sharp who did the evolution of Claire. I thought that was really, really fun. She is super personable and down to earth, and it was just awesome to have a nice conversation with her. Um, we also learned a lot more about um, like the 4D process when it comes to Jurassic World and other movies as well when I spoke with Kirk Miller um, of MX4D. So that was, that was really interesting to learn about that process. Um, I also spoke with Dave Grossman, who we mentioned Jurassic World Revealed earlier. He is the creator of um, Jurassic World Revealed with his company. And Dave Grossman is is a huge like icon in that industry. And like the gaming industry, whether it was like Telltale or um, anything else, I think he even had his hands in some of the spinoffs of like 2XL, uh, the talking robot and stuff like that. So it was really cool to speak with Dave Grossman and to learn a lot about like what he thinks about Jurassic and how to tie it into new mediums and stuff like that. Um, and lastly here, I just wanted to highlight um, our full like JP 25 anniversary retrospective, um, which was just recently. Unfortunately, we didn't get around to it until fairly recently, um, but I got to speak with an awesome, huge fan, Andy Peterson, who, who is like such a super fan, probably bigger than any of us. And, you know, if you if you listen to the episode, he he created an entire master bedroom fully themed to Jurassic Park. He won the JP 25 contest uh, from Tongle where, you know, he created an amazing video. And in that episode, also, we had like a lot of really um, sentimental and emotional pieces from people within the community. Um, So I thought that was important to put together to kind of learn how we all feel about this movie 25 years later. So I thought that was awesome. And, and outside of that, we also had a lot of new stuff. You know, we have yeah. just recently added a new writer, James Ronan, who has been a, a huge um, community member. He is constantly out there discussing things and, and debating things with people out on Twitter. And um, yeah. he's a great writer. So really, I really, really I was going to say, I really like what James does as well. Cause he actually has a paleontology background. Yeah, which yeah. is something that I don't believe we've had before now. So it's no. really, really interesting talking to someone who's actually studying that field and is interacting with professionals in that field as well. He has a exactly. lot of interesting opinions and insight that he shares. I know, I know you always try to cover a lot of the more dinosaur aspects, but you know, James is here now on board as well. So I'm sure he'll be covering some of that and the Jurassic stuff as well. That's it. My job's redundant. You're, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but I know you cover like events and different museums yeah. and stuff like that. So I think um, there'll definitely be a difference there. So I think I'm excited to, to have him on board so far. And um, who else? We added um, Tal, AKA the traveling clot, who is a, a huge guy on YouTube. Um, he's got uh, like a big series where he travels around the world and stuff like that. And that's basically his job is creating these videos on Facebook and YouTube um, about his travels. So that's awesome. He um, he started a segment, Guess That Dino. Um, so we've got more of them. I think we've only had one so far. And uh, I have one in the bank. I'm saving it for the new year. Um, but we also did, let's see, Jurassic Kids popped up. I feel like this has been around forever, but like <laughs> yeah. it was really only this year that AJ Coke and his kids, uh, Abigail and Gabby got on board to produce their own segment, which I thought 
was super phenomenal. We've always been a family show and we know we try to keep it clean and friendly for all all ages and stuff like that. And I thought bringing Jurassic Kids on board was really important. And, you know, outside of AJ, they want to expand it into other people as well. So if you have, you know, your own kids and feel inclined to record your own segments as well, we'll certainly, you know, handle that as well and, and put something together for you guys. But Jurassic Kids, I think, is a really important segment to kind of learn what the people that are younger than Tom think about the franchise. <laughs> Thank you for putting it that way. Yeah. Um, I think it's really special as well because it's the next generation of Jurassic fans. Exactly. So, you yeah. know, these are the people who we're probably going to be handing this podcast down to when we're all old and chilling out with Jurassic Park on the projectors in the care home. So yeah. it's and interesting to think about those people who are going to be carrying this thing on. And I think Guess That Dino as well kind of follows that lead as well because it, it creates a fun segment for kids and families to kind of enjoy and to to wonder about dinosaurs as well. Um, and we also added, let's see, we added the the missing compies. Um, you know, he has his own, Justin Kiley has his own podcast out there. Sorry, I kicked the mic. Um, <laughs> but he has his own um, podcast out there. He's been producing a ton of stuff as well. And he joined the show Earlier in the year, I think it's been a while since we've had um, a segment on here, but he decided, you know, I'm going to cover the books. So he's been trying to dive deep into the books themselves um, with his missing compies segment. So I thought that was a great addition because we really don't cover the books all that much. And he is an avid supporter of the books. So I thought that was great to have somebody that really knows them super well. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think we've been lucky this year because we've grown. We've had loads more listeners like tuning in, calling in from the mailbag. The mailbag is a massive section now. You and Jen get so many calls; it's crazy. Um, yeah, and not just that, but we've had so many more people joining us on YouTube. We've had so many more people interacting on social media, and also so many more people actually saying, "Hey, you." doing really cool stuff how can i come and join in how can i do this stuff as well exactly so i think That's... it's been really special for us this year because jurassic yeah. Park podcast as a thing has grown so much that that was the full intention of this show is to create a space where content creators who don't want to um invest the time to you know create their own thing you know because it's hard you know it takes a lot of time to produce content like this and to have a platform to pay for a service or to have a website and to do all that. I know not everybody out there really wants or cares or knows how to do that. Um, so I figured why not create a space where people can submit their own stuff, have it on a single platform where everybody can get involved. I thought that was the best way to do it. And it, it's really worked out because, yeah, like you said, this past year, we've had a lot of new segments, a lot of new people join in, a lot of listeners join in on the fun. It, certainly with the mailbag has been phenomenal this past year with all the news and updates and everything out there, me and Jen have just had like the most outrageous times. It's been out of control as always. I think this last one that we did was probably one of the most out of control, but best episodes we've ever done. I've had probably more people recently be like, what were you guys talking about? Like, so <laughs> it's been out of control. That's and, how you know it's yeah, a good episode. <laughs> yeah. When people are responding, like, I don't know what upright Arlo is. Please explain. And uh, so, and then of course, with the addition of the Jurassic Wire um, with Aaron Beyer uh, rhyming, I don't know if that was, you know, his, his intention or not when he came up with that segment name, but, um, <laughs> so that's been phenomenal as well to have uh, a place where we can do like a long news discussion, sort of like what we did right here. Um, just, yeah. just like talking about what's going on in the community and the news as well. So I thought that was a really fun addition, um, as a monthly segment. So it's been, it's been crazy. And you mentioned the YouTube stuff too. We really, I feel like we really kicked it off in 2018 with YouTube. We've been doing it for, for years now, but um, as far as like creating new and original content and reviews and, and all kinds of stuff, I think we've done a great job as a team because it's not just me. I know I, I joke with you a lot that, <laughs> that when pe when you release a video or Steve or, or Aaron or whoever out there, AJ put it, puts out a video and, and then the people comment, that's not you. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's, it's not me, but – it's a team. It's a team effort. It's not just me. I, I push out the content and I help, um, you know, manage it, but like, it's not all me. 
So it's it's everybody, and um, that's that's what everybody needs to understand, I guess, when it comes to the YouTube <laughs> channel, because they see my face and hear my voice a lot of the time, most of the time, but then they get little snippets from you guys, and they're like, "Well, who is that person?" I'm like, "Hey guys, it's Tom. Guys. It's it's somebody else that's involved in the show." <laughs> and I think um, I think it's important that everybody out there is creating content and uh, doing some really fun stuff, and it, it's become a really fun channel to. Uh, manage and to to watch grow because it's it's grown quite well and I, I'm I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, me too. I just want to say to anyone who has like seen Brad but doesn't have any idea of the other people on the YouTube channel as well. When you pitch me, I have a thick bushy beard just like Brad does. <laughs> pitch yeah. that beard and that's me. That's yep. That's Tom. Next next video you see Tom, he's definitely gonna go out and buy a beard from the dollar store and put it on his face. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'd have to travel across countries to go to the dollar store. For it. Oh, you guys, you guys don't have dollar stores. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> oh well, yeah. Do I mean, I guess pound you have pound. <laughs> you have, yeah, you have pound stores. My bad. Whatever. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that really wraps up our super long discussion. This is this is mailbag and wire. Uh, you know levels mind. right here so this is I feel like this really always happens when it's me and you as well we're like yeah we'll go for this super short section and then we just get talking and we're like okay like three hours have passed um yep whoops but um you know it's it's the end of the year we had a lot to wrap up i think we did a great job we covered as much as yeah. possible we certainly missed some stuff and and like i said to all the content creators out there you know, thank you so much for everything that you're creating and that you're doing because, you know, this f- community wouldn't be anything without you all. So no, uh, sorry if I missed you, but um, we do still appreciate <laughs> everything that you're doing. I'd like to take a second just to say thanks to everyone who supported the podcast across the past year as well. I know we've already touched on it briefly, but I think we all like, obviously we all have times when we get a bit frustrated with things, but really like, everyone who listens to this podcast and interacts with us and says that they enjoy what we do really just keep it going. So I think on behalf of everyone who works on this podcast, we just like to say that we're really thankful to everyone who always listens to what we do, who interacts, who comes back to us, who like shares the stuff we do over on Twitter or on YouTube. We're really thankful that we're in a position where we've got so many awesome people who actually care about what we're doing and care about the content we're pushing out. And it's really nice to think that there's, all you guys out there enjoying what we're doing. Absolutely. I, I know I'm super appreciative of everybody out there because this podcast wouldn't be anything without anybody. You know, it would just be us rambling. But I'm I'm always still Isn't that shocked. What it is anyway. <laughs> it is, it is, but I'm always shocked that there are people listening. You know, it, it really blows my mind that um however many years later there's still people listening, more and more people. It's it's it hasn't stopped growing, which has been incredible. And the fact that like I said we're producing content in other outlets whether it's writing stuff on the website or creating youtube videos um people people really get it and they have a good time and they're they're enjoying our content which is awesome yeah i think that's a really nice note to end it on just a big thank you to everyone for yeah. making 2018 arguably the biggest year yet for the jurassic park podcast uh, yeah it's only downhill from here <laughs> <laughs> and on that positive night <laughs> Tom, where can everybody find you online? Thank you so much for joining me as well. But um, it's been awesome talking with you about this. But uh, where can everybody find you online? It has. It's been great. Um, For anyone who would like to come and see my very poorly photoshopped posters and the occasional (laughs) moderately acceptable toy photo, um, you can find me on Twitter at Tom underscore Jurassic. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Like I said, so much for joining me here today. I've had a great time, and I hope you all enjoyed uh, our 2018 year in review. And uh, we'll see you in 2019. That's scary to say. Yeah. It is. <laughs> yep. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to the 180th episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. That's a big number. 180. Man, I would never have expected to get this far. But, uh, of course, with the help of people like Tom Fishenden, we are able to produce awesome episodes each and every week. Thank you so much to Tom for joining me for this 2018 year in review. It's been incredible. And I hope we get another year like this, maybe 2021. That's what I'm asking for, guys. 2021, one Jurassic World, three releases. I'm sure we're going to get just as big or even bigger of a year. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. But we do have 2019 and 2020 ahead of us. Let's hope they're pretty good as well. If you want to interact with us, we do most of our work over on Twitter, at Jurassic Park Pod. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Jurassic Park Podcast. And our Instagram handle is at Jurassic Park Podcast. You can listen to us via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, our website, or wherever else podcasts are found. So make sure to subscribe to automatically get new episodes every week. If you haven't already, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will seriously help out our rankings and make it easier for Jurassic fans like you to find us. Don't forget to check out JurassicParkPodcast.com to find everything you heard here today. If you want to get a hold of us, you can email us with any news stories, MP3s, comments, or if you want to debut a segment of your own, send them to JurassicParkPod at gmail.com. Or you could submit questions directly on our website contact form. If you'd like to record something for the show, send it in to us and we'll feature it in an upcoming episode. If you don't have any way to record, you can give our voicemail line a call and leave us a message. That number is 732-825-7763. Thanks for listening and enjoy. No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. Five minutes. Drop what you're doing and leave now.